Today's episode is brought to you by First Detachment. Are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hardworking athletes? Look no further than First Detachment. Wendy's real world experience is what I would consider and they consider battle tested. I have known Justin Harris for pretty close to two decades. And if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. If you guys have followed me and have followed the podcast, you pretty much already know how I feel about the supplement industry. For me to get behind any brand, I have to trust the brand and I have to trust the person both. And I'm pretty sure you guys all know why. When it comes to creating formulas and putting products on the market, and there's nobody that I trust more than Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH first. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code TABLETALK10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description. Americ Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to AmericHealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them, which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative and medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash table talk. The discount code is table talk. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate. We are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. What's going on, guys? We're back with another episode of Table Talk. Today, my guest is John Rivas. Before we get into this, this is episode 198. So when I was looking through the episodes and through the analytics, actually just earlier today, a couple things. Some housekeeping is subscribe if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube because last week I realized 85% of the people who are watching the podcast on YouTube are not subscribed. So if you just subscribed, it would help the podcast tremendously. <clears throat> when looking through you know, past episodes, it was about a year ago when we changed the format of the show. <clears throat> It was at that time I was either just going to dump it entirely or find a different direction for it. And because of you guys helping us to determine and find a new direction for the show, we're able to still have the show continue, grow, and thrive. The reason that we've been able to do that is because we created ways for you all to support the show. One of the ways to support the show is to actually subscribe, like we put there. The other one is through the limited edition wear, which we have a link in the description box. I have one of the new tees on now. We have three other tees that just dropped yesterday. All proceeds from the limited edition apparel go to supporting the podcast. We also have a Discord server or what we call Join the Crew where you can listen to extra episodes of the podcast each month, namely a Q&A of 
you know, questions that we receive through the Discord server. Discord server also has community, also has about 35 eBooks. It has elite FTS team members happen, helping with questions, training, form checks, and all kinds of other things I'm forgetting to mention here. It's, it's well worth more than the value of what it is, but it also goes to directly support the podcast. The other thing I wanna get out of the way really quick is we are running Swiss again in October <clears throat> this year. The link is in the description box as well. Right now we have a pre-launch sale going on which saves something like 39%, should I, I should have done the math a little better to make it 40, but it's like 39%, <laughs> so we're just sticking with what that is. The link is in there, sign up for that. Another benefit that you have by joining the crew and being part of the Discord server is early access to events like Swiss. We're also gonna have a crew event to where we're gonna bring a limited number of people out to train here on the weekend, kind of like our old underground strength sessions that will be from that crew only. So being a member there also has its benefits. So click the description box, join the crew. Now we're gonna move on to the show after I tell you if you buy anything on EliteFTS.com, use the code TABLETALK and get 10% off your first order. Act that out of the way. So <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> John, was brought to my attention. Actually, the name was familiar after John or after Justin brought it to me. So I emailed Justin a while ago asking for people to have on the podcast. A couple of names came up. Yours was one of them. And I'm like, this name is familiar for some reason, but I couldn't really figure it out. So I tar started looking back a little bit and your, your powerlifting yeah. history is where that yep. kind of comes from. Yeah. So recent accomplishments or accomplishments are first in the super heavyweight in the Arnold amateur very 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 close to overall yes for that so yeah. like like a dick hair away right yeah <laughs> so. <laughs> pretty pretty much man that was um you know so doing the arnold amateur is a, a chance to turn pro i've been mm -hmm. pro and in, in the open class and um won my class uh and then got to the point where we were going to the overall and i made a simple mistake of of not having enough food with me the morning of and with bodybuilding it's pretty much ticky tacky do i have enough uh, water in my system as opposed to sodium and the balance and hypernutremia levels and pretty much got on stage and i started flattening out and so i got like second in the overall so i even though i won my class beat all supers um i got second in overall and missed my pro card they only give out one pro card so mm -hmm. now we're on to uh nationals okay nationals at the end of the year you're <clears throat> Powerlifting accomplishments, the the one that, there's a couple that stood out when I went through there. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest one that stood out was beating Dan Green's all-time world record in yeah. 2017. Yeah. I think you did that with a 2088 and 242. Yeah. yeah, man, that was like an, oak. It, you know, everyone's going to say, oh, I could have done better that day, couldn't better. Well, I mean, I'm going to be be honest. I, I, I could have done better. Um, I was dealing with a little bit, and this is what sort of made me stop powerlifting in the end, was uh, I dealt with tight glutes um you know not trying to be funny but actually being serious i dealt with tight glutes and it would pull on my it band mm -hmm. so anytime i would i would uh it would get inflamed i couldn't break parallel and it would hurt to the point that i remember i was down training with goggins in 2014 and i came to him and i was like i graduated college at virginia military institute and i came to him and i was like i think i'm done i can't do this anymore and he was like, no, 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 let's work some stuff. So we figured some things out with stretching. I actually went and got an MRI as well. And they were like, it's just inflamed. I'm like, oh, sick. I spent two grand for nothing. <laughs> but uh, got that one right. I had on the day I broke the record in Vegas, I was probably, I think I went six for eight or something around there. You know, it was funny. The first squat, um, they called me for not depth, but they called me because my elbow touched my thigh. And so they're like, no lift. And I was like, Ugh. so I ignored it, you know, and I'm like, okay, we, we've got to focus on, on getting the next one. That was the USPA and they called you for that? That was USPA. Yeah, USPA Nationals in, in like Vegas. That's like IPF shit. I know. I was like, <laughs> I was like you know, because I went to IPF Worlds in 2012, yeah, yeah. Virginia Worlds, and, and I was like, man, I'm back there. But that was okay. Yeah. I was used to it. Yeah. So quarterback mindset, went to the second attempt, did it, third attempt, did it. Um went to bench, smoked my opener, went second attempt, 512. I was going to go about probably five, what was it, 527 that day I was set for. So I go like 512 and I was bringing it out. And um, 
I'm not going to put him on blast, but when I, I brought it out, I'm used to saying like out, 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 mm -hmm. AKA bring it. So I'm able to come sort of more of a straight down instead of, you know, you notice when guys first start lifting, they bring it sort of over their eyes and then they have this sort of swoop motion. And um, so for me being used to single ply gear and stuff, I had to be in the groove, mm -hmm. you know, so now I'm raw. I'm still have to be in the groove. And so I'm telling him out, 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 out. Well, he thought I was saying, ow. Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> so then he yanks it back and I yank it out of his hands. And as soon as I did that, tweak in my pec minor. So now I've got 512 over mm -hmm. me. And I'm like, if I don't do this, I don't break the record. Yeah. Right. And all that went through my head in a millisecond. Well, I do it. And you notice if you watch the video of Nationals that year, probably the last two or three inches, I just dropped it. And then it was the hardest 512 I had ever mm -hmm. done. And I, I just muscled it up. And, uh, you know, then we got that. So then we moved to the third, the deadlift. Um, by this time, it was almost 12 hours after we started. And I was able to, I smoked my opener. I went 832 on my second, got that. But then, you know, me and Goggins are hugging backstage. You know, we're, yeah. it's like, man, we went from not being able to squat a year and a half ago to, to breaking the all-time world record. And I, I, I energy dumped, adrenaline dumped. Went like 865, couldn't get it above my knees. Either way, I'd still broken the record. Yeah, the, the pull was good. If, if we're to play this what if game, you know, I'm looking through here, and not, not that far off of this, you squatted 804 in the same class. So you left, you know, like it would make you feel bad, right? Yeah. So you, you, left, you left 60 <laughs> pounds on, on the squat. You left 60 pounds on the squat. Yeah. You know, left about 20 there on the bench. So, yeah. you know, that could have been 20, close to 22. Yeah, the, the, my my meet after that, um, I was like, let me, you know, because after that, I think Larry and uh, I think Larry and Andrew Herbert um, had chipped it, I believe. I'm trying to think back. T. Popola, maybe. And so I was like, okay, let me get it one more time. Mm -hmm. Let me go 2175, something like that. I, I was pretty much set for that. And I was warming up. It was a meet in Virginia Beach, and I was warming up. Had buddies come in, everyone. It, Dave Ricks was there supporting me. Um, I was a friend from way back in, in Atlanta. And I was like, okay, this is it. Local meet. I'm going to do, do what I got to do. And uh, it's warming up in the back. And I hit a 675 squat. Whoa, boom. I'm like, oh. As soon as I came up, rip, hamstring, just like a zipper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, well, maybe it was a tweak. I tried to pull 135 like a couple minutes later. Couldn't do it. So after that... That was a pretty big uh, a hit to me. And at this point, you know, after setting the record, I was already getting to the mental state where what's next? Mm -hmm. What's next? You know, I, I do, I, I'm killing myself to break this record. I break the record. You know, I got to keep breaking it. You know, that's pretty much the goal. Because now I'm at this point, I'm out of USAPL. I'm out of IPF. Yeah. I can't go to Worlds anymore. I can't go to World Games. And uh, so then it's just breaking records. And at that point, probably two months after that last meet, I was starting to get the, the, the tendonitis and from my IT band came back even worse. And uh, I couldn't get up off my, I was 26 and I couldn't get up off my couch. And I was going to Kroger the next day. I called my, my best bud, Duranda Mason. Um, we're powerlifting history buffs um, in Richmond. And I was like, man, I can't do it. I just, I'm not going to be able to do safely what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And this is really hard. A lot of us lifters come to that point, whether it's due to age, whether it's due to an injury, we all get to that point where we have to be like, I'm not that guy anymore for whatever reason. And uh, we all have egos of some sort, you know, and I told him, you know what, let me find something else. So I, I saw the, the Jay Cutler show, NPC bodybuilding show was like, 10 weeks out and I'd never I had been doing curls mm -hmm. you know and so I was like okay <clears throat> let's do it and he's a supportive guy Duran is supportive so he told me he's like let's go to work we're gonna have to go to work so I trained for that for about eight to ten weeks and I, I won um I won my class and I was like okay if you know before I did the show I was like if I look like garbage I'll go back to powerlifting if I look okay 100 percent and we looked okay and we won and I was nationally qualified at my first show and um, just haven't looked back since. Well, you're at, at that point, you're almost 
a decade into the powerlifting too, at least yes. close to a decade into the competing. Yes, yes. Where mm-hmm. you know your your first total. I just like to put this out here because a lot of people listen to this and they don't think they're good enough. Yeah, you know, for yeah, the, yeah. The, you get that asked too. Like, should I do a show? Should I do a meet? Yes, 100%. And, oh, I'm not good enough. Well, your first total was eleven. What eleven ninety six? When was that? Which one was that? That was well. This is the first one like, here, yeah, right? So yeah. that's US USAPL powerlifting classic Virginia. Um, single ply 181, 402, oh, dude, 292, yeah. 501. Um, I mean, not bad numbers, right? For somebody that's that's 19 getting started, yeah. but that usually what I see when I see numbers like this is there could have been a meter or two missed that's not on yeah. here, yeah. And there was definitely time training for it to where you didn't compete yet. Mm-hmm. Kind of going through mm-hmm. the same thing mm-hmm. that people do now. Yeah. Oh, I'm not strong enough to compete, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Where it you went from. Obviously, you had the genetics to be able to succeed with the work ethic. I'm never going to sit here and say genetics alone is going to do anything. Everybody yeah. knows that's bullshit. Yeah. If that was true, there would be a lot more people doing For really sure. great things. But you hit the um, the junior worlds in, was it that, 2012. Yeah. So that was 9, 10, 11, like three, four years yeah. after winning the junior world. So it's <clears throat> where I'm going with this. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the powerlifting part of all this because mm-hmm. it's the journeys that's really more intriguing to me yeah. is if it's, if it's bodybuilders, straw man for that matter too, anybody that's in the strength athlete realm, mm-hmm. they'll get to a point where when you start and you, and you realize I'm doing this and you're going to put everything into it. Mm-hmm. So you want to break an all-time world record or you want to get a world championship. Well, then it gets fucking weird once you do it. Yeah. Right? Because it's like, okay, I just spent eight years driving towards this one thing, and now I got it. Now now what? Repeat? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's, Mm -hmm. I'm talking to enough people in the strength sport athlete side that it's, it's weird, right? Because it's, you don't know really what to do. Yeah. And then usually after about a decade, you also start to have the nicks and the dings and the mm-hmm. things start coming mm-hmm. up where some, as I'm sure you're aware of, just keep driving through it. And some do drive through it and get better. So I don't, let's, let's, let's yeah. put that aside, but that's not, the, that's, that's not very many of them, but it does happen. So we have to acknowledge that, but most of them just keep driving through it, just get more and more fucked up. Yep. You know, but love doing mm-hmm. what they're doing. Other ones find a different path. You know, in powerlifting, some of them just start drinking beer, get fat, and never yeah. train again <laughs> because it's so much of their identity. They don't know what else to do. Um, other ones pivot into a different strength sport. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that's also kind of a rare thing too. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be strongman or it could be powerlifting. You drifted into the bodybuilding yes. side for that. The but you're it, it, during that crossroad period. There still had to be an, some some type of identity shift. Yeah, there there was, you know, and, and I'll go back a little bit. Yeah, when I started, I, I started training in two thousand five. I was fourteen, mm-hmm. um, and I went from you know I played soccer for many years, and uh, my family is we have some big people in my family, and I remember seeing a forty five pound barbell when I was like six or five, my dad's like, one day you'll get that. You know, my dad was a uh, Marine. Um, and then he worked in, you know, CIA. And, uh, so we were a very strict household. I was not allowed to touch the barbells in the basement until I was old enough. <laughs> well, old enough. yeah. So <laughs> I went, uh, you know, I started lifting on my own probably in like, like you said, 2004, 2005, watching everything. I remember watching Justin Harris uh, squatting, and I was like, I want to look like that. I remember watching Marius. I remember seeing uh, the Mountaineer Cup, um, Goggins, Cone, you know, all the guys that even I, I deep dove mm-hmm. into powerlifting, into strongman, everything, anything and everything I could think of. You know, I lived in a country town, and we would drive into the, into the city in Richmond, Virginia to go to school, and nothing... Uh, I hadn't found something in my life that made me feel, you know, I was skateboarding back then, the X games were coming out, but I hadn't found something that made me feel like, I love this. This is, pa- this is my passion. And then when I started developing it and finding it, I just couldn't stop researching. I couldn't stop looking. I couldn't, re- back then it was like the get big forums and mm-hmm. you know, all that crazy stuff online back then, uh, streaming, taking up all the bandwidth of the internet back then. It was like 2005, my parents hated me. So I got in trouble for that, trying to stream the Olympia when Ronnie, I think, won his last one. Um, 
But then, you know, in high school, I noticed that I was a, I was a lean guy, 165, maybe five foot nine could, that was towards the end too. So maybe like 150 when I started and within about a year, I was benching 315 with no training, no coach, no nothing, just lifting. I would go to the gym by myself and lift and I became obsessed. I don't know if it was the endorphins. I don't know what it was, but I said, Sean Ray, you know, Ronnie Coleman, Mari Spuchanowski, uh, Captain Kirk Kowalski, mm-hmm. Ed Cohen. I want to be like these guys. And uh, I would just envision, envision, envision. And it became such a part of me that I don't know why or how it developed, but I developed this sense of uh, like blockers, you know, like I, I pretty much, that's all I cared about. Growing up out of high school, I quit football for it. Um, I ended up going to Virginia Military Institute 2009 and I had been already training and you know maxing out and things like that but I never really competed in a sanctioned meet and I went up to uh well we were going through this hell week right so VMI is pretty much like West Point Mm -hmm. said all those things and um we're going through a hell week and we got a uh an hour to go to all the club sports and try to find something and I went and I saw this big guy and at this point, I've been lifting for about four or five years, and I'm obsessed. I want to go to this school. I want to, you know, possibly, you know, commission in the military. But I, I can't stop lifting. I have to keep training. And I saw this big dude, and I was like, I'm going to go talk to him. Maybe he's a lifter. Well, I looked, and it was a powerlifting um, uh, club at the, at the school. And his name was Monty Sparkman. And I went up to him, and I go... Can, you know, can I join your club? I'm trying to, you know, get away from as much of the yeah. military stuff as I can because they're, they're, you know, screening our face and stuff. Maybe this will be like a little outlet for an hour. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, and I'm sure he's used to a million kids coming up to him want to do it. And he said, well, what's your experience? Said, well, you know, I'm used to posing. I think I did a natural bodybuilding show or something. And he looks <laughs> at me and goes, nah, we don't do that here. And I'm shocked. I'm like 18, 19, like, but he's like, all right, come at this time, 4.30. And as a, as a rat, you're a freshman, you're a rat. Mm-hmm. You don't have time to go do stuff. But somehow I managed to, if you want it bad enough, you'll time balance and make it work. Well, in between all that yelling and school and everything, I was able to get down to the gym. And Monty was like, here's your program. I believe at the time it was a 5-3-1. Um, I hadn't messed with conjugate or anything yet. I didn't even know anything about anything. What's a 45-pound bar? What's a Mastodon bar? I don't know any of that. Um, so long story short, my first powerlifting meet um, is my first or second. I can't remember. But first ever when I qualified for collegiate nationals. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and at that time, qualifying was pretty hard. Um, it wasn't a walk in the park. And on top of that, I was using single ply. I had no idea what I was doing. My super centurion was probably that much of a gap in the leg. You know, I'm using an F6 that I could have just put on as a t-shirt, but I qualified and uh, I was able to do okay at collegiates that year. But I remember standing up for for check-ins and I'm like about 5'11". And I stood up for check-ins and I was in the 181 class and I stood up and everyone comes up to my shoulder. I'm like, I need to learn a little bit more about the sport before I do anything. So the next year, I was a little tweaked. I didn't qualify for collegiates my second year at the school, so I coached. By this time, I'm fully ingrained. I love powerlifting. I love the strength aspect, but I'm still messing around with bodybuilding training on the side. I didn't tell Monty that at the time, so forgive me, coach. (laughs) But I wasn't making the gains I thought I knew I could. Well, after I got injured my sophomore year, I said, 100%. I'm going 100% powerlifting. I know I can do this. I want to accomplish something. I stopped all the extra bodybuilding volume. I stopped all that stuff, and I noticed within, I would say, two years, my squat went from like a 500, 520 something to a 793, almost 800. So within two years, I brought my squat up almost 300 pounds, Um, 100% drug free. We were tested multiple times a year. I went to military school. I got drug tested all the time. Um, And what do you think that was? What do you think accounted for that the most? What it was was. I learned, I learned that the extra, the amount of 
caloric expenditure I was doing at the school with the military training, the running, um, the extra bodybuilding, the stress from Oh yeah, I forgot. I'm in college too, mm -hmm. and I'm not the brightest bulb. So I'm like, I'm staying up late. We're getting up every morning for formation the whole nine. When I got rid of the excess garbage volume I was doing that wasn't geared towards my weaknesses or, or movements or anything like that, immediately I was like, wait, all I have to do is focus on my deadlift, squat, and bench. That that sounds fun. I'm yeah, excited, yeah. and I started enjoying it more. And the lifts just started shooting up. Um, so Sherman Ledford out of, uh, quest athletics, you know, Brian Siders, Wade mm -hmm. Hooper, they all used to be on that team. He contacted me and cause I think I was my, by my junior year when I made my comeback after being hurt, became collegiate all American. The next month I won uh, USAPL junior nationals in my weight class, qualified for team USA and IPF went to IPF worlds medaled there. And Sherman hit me up and he was like, hey, bub, that's the way he talks. <laughs> hey, mm -hmm. bub, I want to bring you on the team. I'm like, oh, this is amazing, man. As a, as a historian of the sport, I'm like, this is a dream come true. And uh, I was able to get on there. I, the funny thing about that was my numbers went up so fast that the people who were on the team currently, because we were sort of rebuilding the team after Siders and everyone left, um, Caleb Williams as well. And so we were rebuilding the team. The people on there didn't want me on the team. And we be all became cool after. But they didn't want me on the team because they thought I was just blasting drugs. That's how my list went up. It wasn't true. I got on the team. We all did well. Um, did well my senior year. And went, got, you know, another collegiate All-American. And then after that, it was like, okay, what do I do? You know, this is still my identity, right? That's what we were talking about. Still my identity. So I got a job working for Sherman down at Quest in Atlanta. And so I was around powerlifting 24 seven. And at this time, my hip was really hurting, the IT band. And I, I saw Steve Goggins at a local USAPL meet because US, USPA wasn't big at that time down there. And I saw him and I was like, starstruck. I'm refing the meet mm -hmm. and I'm like, man, I, you know, you be around some bodybuilders at expos. They don't have, they don't have the time of day for you. Mm -hmm. They don't care. But I walked over to Steve and I said, you know, Mr. Goggins, honored to meet you. Like, it's a pleasure. And it's hard to explain to someone how much they've affected you in your life. They don't even know you, mm -hmm. right? But you've been following them for years. So I'm trying to tell them really quickly, you know, it's, it's an honor. You know, maybe you could look at my lift sometime if that's cool. If you, if you got time, you know, I want to, mm -hmm. you know, force it on you. And he turned around. He sort of did his, you know, like Steve chuckle. Like, yeah, man, he's like come on over to the house. I live around the corner. I was like, really? So now, you know, I'm a year out of college and I get to go train with Steve Goggins. And I worked on there for a year. And in the morning, I was still taking one class to graduate. They let me move and work and take one class. And so in the morning, I'd wake up at five, go to the gym, open up the gym, run the websites, shipping, all that stuff. And then uh, around three o'clock, I would leave drive to the marta the train station down there take the train into the city get off walk a couple blocks take my econometrics class i'd have to leave class 10 minutes early take the train back to uh the stop drive back to the gym personal train people so i had enough money to live get out of that go home eat drive to steve's at like 8 30 9 o'clock at night but then we'd start training mm -hmm. and then i would get done with that and the funny thing was me and Steve became very close and we're still very close to this day, but there are some points where I just wanted to hang out with him. Mm -hmm. You know, I just wanted to learn. And after we train, it's 1130 at night. I'm like, Steve, you got any videos of you training for WPO? You got 800, 900 pound deadlifts. You got any of that stuff and you squat 1100. We'd go upstairs, just sit there and watch training mm -hmm. from coffee's gym in Georgia. We just watched training for an hour. And then I realized, oh, it's one o'clock. I have about three hours of sleep I got to get yeah. before I started all over again. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I am 100% in. It is 100% my identity. I've given up dates, you know, possible girlfriends, all that stuff. Man, that stuff don't matter. Yeah. That stuff doesn't matter when you have a passion, you found it. Um, which in, I'll explain later, you know, that stuff is important as well. Well, you don't have the time either. So being realistic no with that schedule, you don't have the time. Yeah. And so long story short, I trained with Steve for a while. He got me back on track. Um, 
at the time I was benching drug free as a junior, I had the biggest bench press in the U S for my weight class, like USAPL as a junior, including the open class. So we're doing well. Um, I go to raw nationals that year. It was just starting to blow up 2013, 2014. And I was, I was on track to get first that year. I was second with the final pull. Um, we were in Denver, one used to it. Um, it just felt weird with the, the heights and stuff like that, the mile high and missed pretty much every third lift that day. And then ended up getting third, I believe at the end, which was cool as a junior lifter in the open class. And uh, then I was like, okay, what do we do? Do we continue this? I'm the type of guy that wants a challenge. Mm -hmm. What's next? Let's go swim with the big boys. I'm 25 at this point. I'm not, you know, I'm a meathead, but I'm not insanely a meathead. And so I'm like, when does my endocrine system, you know, when does it stop trying to develop? Mm -hmm. Around 25. Okay. Let's do what we have to do, take what we have to take to go play with the big boys. I don't believe, personally, everyone can do whatever they want. I don't judge them. Live your life. Do what makes you happy as long as it doesn't affect anyone else. Cool, man. But uh, I, I, I decided that I'm not going to play the game of doing something and competing against people that aren't doing it just to give me a little bit of advantage. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I want to jump in the deep end. And if, you know, if I suck, beat me down. Tell me I suck. Because guess what? That's more of a challenge. Yeah. I'm excited. I want that challenge. I want to be pushed. So went to Raw Unity uh, 2015. Yeah, 2015 or 20. Yeah, 2015. And I just started my first cycle. I think it was 250 test and 25 D ball. Totaled 2,000 after like eight weeks of doing that. I was like, oh, cool. This might work. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, got my squat up to like, I think I was squatting. 850 and wraps pretty well and everything felt really good and then a year after that so 2016 is when i broke the all-time world record i wasn't used to raw raw we call it raw raw yeah, yeah yeah well you're coming from single ply too yeah so i did single ply and then when i went uspa i went just knee wraps wraps okay mm -hmm. so then you went sleeves or and just then, bare knees yeah and so believe it or not the the first meet in USPA that I did sleeves was when I broke the record. And if I had stuck it out longer, like you said, woulda, shoulda, coulda, you know, but at that point, once again, we're talking about that identity. I didn't have any more. Once I broke the record, I'm walking on the platform. My hands are up. I'm saying, you know, I did it. This is coming from a place that no one has ever seen. No one knows about but me. And the passion and everything was just, we did it. We did it. We broke the record. Now what? Mm -hmm. You know, I almost didn't sleep for two days going back after that record. Well, I, you know, I'm like, okay. I had about two months with it. And then the ego check was it got broke, which all records are meant to be broken. Yeah. yeah. But it was good. It was good for me because I thought, well, I break this record. I'll get 10,000 followers. I'll be the man. No one can touch me. <laughs> well, that was an ego check, man. I go to the grocery store, you know, and this granny hits me with her cart trying to get chicken. She don't care what my bench press is. Yeah. It was a good ego check. Uh, lost the record. A couple months later, I decide to try to get it back again. And that's when, you know, I got hurt warming up. And I decided I, I don't have it anymore, man. I don't have the passion to be able to do what I need to do to get to that level. People say, come back to powerlifting, man. You're bigger now. You're stronger now. You're going to crush it. You, that means you probably don't know and you haven't been there, which is fine, but you haven't been to that point to know what it takes mentally and physically to do those things. And I knew if it's not here, you know, we can be strong, but if it's not here, you're going to get hurt. Yeah. Something bad's going to happen. And I had to move on from it. So I had it. What your question was, you know, that was a long answer, yeah. but the question was, what did I do between that time of I'm 26? I was at the top. What do I do now? I all of a sudden what I had and what I was for years is taken from me. Do I just, I don't know, CrossFit? 
no, I can't do CrossFit. Not that CrossFit's bad, guys. Mm-hmm. Um, what do I do? Well, I always watched Ronnie Coleman. I always watched Cutler. I always watched Paul Dillette, Sean Ray, all those guys. Man, but I, I've never done a bicep curl, you know, in the past, like, nine years. Bicep curls didn't get my rack pull, my, my squat up. Let me just try to cut down. Let me just see. I'll give it my all, but I don't care, man. If I look like garbage on stage, I'll... Well, I won, and I was like, new identity. And I would say there's probably about a a three-month period where, man, this is going to sound really dorky, but I didn't necessarily believe in a lot of mental health back then. You're a kid. You know, you're in your 20s. We've all been there. We're invincible. But there was a point where I didn't, I hadn't decided I was doing bodybuilding yet. And I woke up at two or three o'clock in the morning. I remember it's like yesterday. And I started texting people. I started texting my friends. Uh, I texted a good friend, Nally Hansen. And I had texted him like, I, I just, I'm sorry for this and that. And apologizing for things. I didn't even, didn't even make sense to me. I was, it was just flowing out of me. And for about a day, I just, I was just a sad sack of shit. Couldn't go to the gym, couldn't do nothing. I'm like, what is wrong with me? Like, what just happened, dude? I can't sleep. What happened? Eventually, I talked to a few friends, got over it, got my mind straight, went on the bodybuilding path. But that was sort of my moment where, you know, I had that, like you said, that moment of, dude, what do I do? What am I here for? I've been dedicating my life for years to this. It's my passion. I know I want to do something with this. Now I have nothing. So that, that was probably my moment of where it was, it was pretty tough. I think when, <clears throat> when you have a, any athlete, for that matter, I can just speak about strength athletes because that's my world, right? So mm-hmm. just make assumptions across the board because yeah. that's what we do. And um, when you have somebody that, if you want to say all in, mm-hmm. right? Because that's a fucked up thing, and I've talked about this before on the podcast, because you're all in. <laughs> your all in is definitely defined differently than, say, somebody else's. Somebody yeah. else's all in, we may look at and think, okay, sure. You know, and maybe even fucking joke around with it, which is kind of fucked up, but we would. But yeah. to them, that's the most all in they've ever been, yes. which means they showed up twice a month to do something. Yeah. Where there's this other fucked up area to where it is everything. Yeah. You know, everything that you do from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep. And part of it is addicting. Part of it is also uh, blinders and a shelter and mm-hmm. making yourself, putting yourself in a bubble that you're pretty comfortable with because yeah. anything outside that bubble, fuck it. It's not helping me. This yep. is what I need to do. And it's, it's great to help you accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. It can be viewed as negative, you know, usually by others that aren't in the bubble, but usually, you know, negative. And then once you kind of break out of it, you're lost, Right. Because for, I think for for two reasons, I mean, for me, it was kind of two uh, multiple reasons. But for two reasons, the first is you're not too goddamn sure if you ever want to go in that bubble again. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah that, that's yeah. a fucked up thing. Right. Yep. Because it's yep. and but you think you have to to be able to accomplish whatever you go. That's to all next. you know. Yeah, exactly. Because you know. the success was there. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, if I don't do that, then it's that kind of weird ass thing. But I think that you learn how to do it more intelligently. Like when, when you're younger, mm-hmm. you know, there's, there, you're also managing a lot though too, because there's school, there's all these other factors yes. yeah. that kind of compile into all that. Yeah. Where I, th- I definitely think personally, it's a necessary trait. Mm-hmm. And, but when, you, when you're away from it, it's almost like you have too much idle time. Yeah. You know, and you know, too much idle times, devil's time. Yep, devil's playground. Right? Yeah. yeah, and then you're like, fuck. Yeah. You know, all I'm doing is watching fucking Brady Bunch or Netflix. And, and or- let's let's be completely honest. A lot of us are addicts, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's just addicted to the feeling or addicted to hanging out with our friends at the gym or being in a community or addicted to the pump or unfortunately addicted to steroids, which, you know, it, you know, steroids can be completely fine if used correctly, but if we become addicts to whatever it is, we know too much of anything mm-hmm. is bad. Too much Advil will kill you, you know? So it, it's interesting that we almost have to just find something that's positive to be an addict about. Yes. You know? Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, you can take anybody, no matter what they do, and mm -hmm. say they're they're addicted to whatever they do. Yeah. You know, so it's if it's if it's moving towards your goals and you selectively change it to put it in there, then, like you said, you know, mm -hmm. you 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 find those things as long as they're all complementary. Yeah. Because you can get addicted to shit that's not complementary to what you're trying to do. Then it's a mess. Yep. Right. Then you're addicted to like alcohol and yeah bodybuilding which fuck, i've known people to do that yeah. you know so there's yeah. Yeah. there's still there's still that way where with with bodybuilding from that it sounds to me like you were always kind of in the bodybuilding world as a fan spectator mm -hmm. yeah. and um you had aspirational figures you were looking up to that were there mm -hmm. so it's not that big of a leap to be able to go from this world to that world mm -hmm. because you're kind of in it to begin with mm -hmm. And now that you've migrated into that world and you're having success in that world mm -hmm. is because what we were talking about earlier with that drive there, I, I would say it's also passion too, mm -hmm. where you could have stayed in there and still done the day to day and the work necessary to do and probably keep beating records and all the other kind of stuff. But it's not going to be the same mm -hmm. because the passion isn't, and we all have seen, I've seen, you've, we've all seen people in strength sports that lost their passion, but they're just, this is just what they do, mm -hmm. you know, so they just keep fucking doing it yep. because that's what they've been programmed to do. That's, mm -hmm. They like it. Yeah. They're happy with it. They're just not fucking passionate about it because mm -hmm. they just don't know anything else. Yep. And so it's possible with the bodybuilding, did that discipline that you had and that all in drive find that passion? Mm -hmm for bodybuilding that you had for powerlifting uh, that was it i mean and, and and that was where i was setting myself up like i said where i was like okay if i do well 100 percent. but if i don't do well i'm not even going to give it an ounce like an ounce of time right because i need to find something that you know not that if i if i if i suck at it the first time i'm going to give up yeah but i want to find something that i know is 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 right for me Let's be honest. I'm I'm not going to play basketball at an NBA level. Mm -hmm. You know, some people like to have the mindset where if you don't believe you're going to be Mr. Olympia, or if you don't believe this, then you know you're worthless. Let's keep it honest. If that's your whole mindset, you're going to burn out really fast. So I was like, okay, let me find something that I'm going to have to work for, but I'm going to enjoy and I'm going to find you know know that at some point I can be successful through hard work. And that was when I when I did well with the first show. Uh, I, I was I was hooked. I was hooked. You know, your, your statement about the Olympia thing, I always find it kind of weird. I, I understand it because what mm -hmm. there's only been what sixteen or I don't know how many Mr. Olympias yeah. there. There yeah. hasn't been that many. No. But I don't think any single one of them has stated. Yeah, I knew when I got in I was going to be Mr. Olympia. No. I'm pretty sure they all fucking at one point and said, you know what? I never thought. Yep. I could have been that, which. It's kind of fucked up because it's if if you're going to have two different belief sets, I'd rather have the one that's going to fall short, but believing that you can actually yeah. do something great, than the one that just thinks you can't do great things. Mm -hmm. Like that's fucked up. But then, but then again, also, is that what drives people? Is that is that no not thinking that you're not good enough? Is that what makes people become what you know, Mister Olympia and things like that? It definitely could be. Yeah. And, it's, and I don't think anywhere along any of their paths does that actually become this tangible goal until they've already stumbled across to be able to realize, mm -hmm. you know what, I'm good at this. I'm a freak. <laughs> I have the yeah. genetics, right? Yeah. Because it's, I've always said, you know, people will use this genetic card, but how do you know if you have the genetics or not if you never really fucking tried really, really hard? Exactly. Right? You know, mm -hmm. and now your case in the powerlifting, yeah, it was kind of obvious pretty soon. Yeah. But that <laughs> still wasn't guaranteeing no mm -hmm. fucking world record. Mm -hmm. That might guarantee getting to the nationals or getting mm -hmm. to a certain point, but it takes a lot more than that for the other mm -hmm. thing. And once that those things stack, then it's like, okay, have I had self-limiting beliefs? You know, should I change my belief system? There, you don't want to, anybody that's going to start from the jump, I'm going to break all time world records. I'm going to be Mr. Olympia is got problems mm -hmm. because they're going to, they're not going to have the right mindset to endure all the discipline and short term goals that they mm -hmm. have to accomplish to get there. 
because they're thinking too does that make sense because yeah. it's not fucking easy 100 you know none of this is easy you know sometimes i think that gets left out yeah. in conversations like this where people are like oh you just do this it's like no man there's still things you're still training through yeah tweaks and twinges and you're still going to the still gym when you don't want to you still fucking yep. missed a triple that you shouldn't have fucking missed yeah <laughs> still got still got to show up for work you yeah. know yeah. yeah so with the bodybuilding what we, forget the first show but say you're into the, like the second and the third show mm -hmm. what was it about it that hooked you i would say the first show i was hooked um and then it was like looking at the photos and being you know non-biased and you know once again okay hey i have to figure out and fix my weaknesses i have to get better and in bodybuilding it's finding body parts as opposed to movements so you know pile of thing i've got to work on my lockout i've got to work on my speed off the floor this that and third oh, i'm having valgus knee movement in the hole with squat things like that in bodybuilding, it's similar. It's just, okay, my rear delts really suck genetically. I'm going to have to pound that. Let me try and train him twice a week. Let me try this movement. Let me try that movement. And then it, it just developed into this, oh, man, there's so much more I have to do, right? There's so much more I have to learn about my body and this and that, and I just became obsessed with it. How did you wrap your head around coming from – objective judging or not objective you squat it or you don't and granted there's still subjectivity in powerlifting mm -hmm. if we if you've really been in it you know what we're talking about there's still mm -hmm. depth and there's still weird calls mm -hmm. but either you lift the weight or you don't mm -hmm. you know on bodybuilding you 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 can you can miss by a dick hair mm -hmm. and that that's a different it's a different world yeah. where how do you how Subje are you dealing with that versus objectivity yeah how are you dealing with that I would say that I'm not the type of person I'm going to be, we're going to be hard on ourselves no matter what. We're our own worst critics. I'm not the type of person to ever find an excuse. Mm -hmm. I don't care if I didn't get my food in. I don't care if I, I peaked wrong or whatever. I still didn't do it. Right. So I'm not going to harp on that. When I did bad at USA's, my first national show, I won an overall at the, the NPC Southern Tournament of Champions. And I'm like, man, I'm on top of the world. I went and filmed with Jay Cutler on Jay Cutler TV. You know, I went out to San Diego to train with Chris Cormier. Had a great weekend with him. Learned a lot of stuff. Came back, getting ready for USA's. At this point, I'm getting close to nine months of prep. And at, at, for those who, guys you don't know, when you're a bodybuilder, at a certain point, your body stops uh, the, uh, how do I say, the receptors. Stop reacting so much to certain things you're taking, supplements, uh, whether it be a steroid or whatever, or you just might be worn out. You just might be worn out. Your, your GI health might be all messed up and you're, you're, you're starting to get tweaks and, and pulls and stuff. My body wasn't responding going into USAs. And so I knew it was going to be... Mm -hmm. And so we tried to do some things at the last minute and we became flat, small, stringy. I'm a taller guy. So all those things we can't have on stage. Four weeks out of USA's in 2021, I trained with a buddy. We did it probably, we trained for too long the day before. We did legs for too long. A little bit more than I was used to. The next day I go into the gym, I'm warming up with calves. Simple, uh, what's it called? Like a, a pin leg press machine, easy yeah. stuff. Just warming up. Uh, my, my third set, boom, leg goes out. Someone took a baseball bat to my calf. And I go, I know what that is. It's either Achilles or I blew my calf out. Tried to step off. There's no way this happened four weeks out. Just filmed with Jay Cutler. There's no way this happened. Took a step, couldn't walk. Walked over to the car. Was like, hey, it is what it is. You know, I called a buddy. I was like, this just happened, you know, but I got to finish. I got to finish. So then I start going back to the gym. I'm like trying to walk it off like it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I don't want people looking at me and whatnot. And uh, I look down at my calves, comple legs completely swollen. At this point, I don't know what happened. I don't know what it is. Whatever, I got to finish. Finish the workout, go home. Turns out, you know, you have your soleus and gastrocnemius. Well, a band of 
the muscul musculature of my soleus snapped. And uh, luckily it wasn't the whole thing. It, it grew back. It's fine now. There's no indentation in bodybuilding. You know, if you tweak something in powerlifting or strength sport, who gives a F as long as it doesn't affect the movement or create additional reason for stabilization or whatever. In, in bodybuilding, dude, if you slight tweak a muscle belly and it shows a divot or something on your physique, you might be dinged forever. Mm -hmm. So this stress and everything going in, it was like, man, this is not going to be good. So we, we did what we could. And as soon as I go on stage to hit my first pose at USA's, I turn around, hit a back double bicep, pow, calf goes again. Because it was, it was scar tissue at that point. It wasn't fully connected again. The, the, probably the most amount of pain I've ever felt in some sort of competition. Had to keep a straight face. Didn't complain. Didn't whatever. Judges didn't even look at me. Watched me walked me off is what it is. You know, at, at, when I was younger, I would have said, man, this is effed up, F this. You know, I had it, my significant other with me, my fiance, who is now, but was my girlfriend at the time, I, I would have gone to her pouted in a little punk, you know, but maturity and, and realizing that, you know, she's there to support me. Other people are there to support me. Stop being such a selfish POS. And so, you know, I got off stage. I said, let me sulk for about 10 minutes and then we're good. And so that's how I deal with things. When I was younger, I would go, I would, I would, if I did bad, once again, blame myself, but I would go away. And I wouldn't thank those people for coming out to support me and stuff. I was like, I wouldn't get mad or say anything. I just wouldn't thank anyone, be normal, smile on my face. But now when something bad happens, I'm still alive. I'm still kicking. I'm still breathing. You're going to be a punk and just give up? Dude, that's not me. So recover from that. year and a half later, I said, let's do the Arnold. And so we did, and we looked great, and, you know, won our class and stuff, and just barely missed a pro card. So that was pretty big, going from not even being looked at a year and a half before to being one of the top amateur bodybuilders in the nation. That was uh, – pretty much the moment where it solidified like you getting mad i think the biggest lesson i learned from all of that was focus on the goal focus on kicking your ass don't allow the negativity and stuff to affect your loved ones don't it allow to, don't allow it to affect anything negative outside these people you know your family your friends all this stuff if they're letting you do your passion and care about it support them like you don't have to you know make sure they've they've got the red carpet rolled out of your meat or wherever you're going but just remember in the back of your mind that they love you they're there to support you they're not your enemies right so make sure no matter what happens whether you blow out a calf and get last place or you bomb your squats you train six months for that you show appreciation because at the end of the day when you hang up the canvas suit when you hang up your little teeny tiny bikini pose and trunks or whatever it is, who's going to be there for you? You know, well, I would make the argument too, that the, those are the people that are actually sacrificing. You're not, I agree. You know, so I agree. with you starting training, I believe in high school or it was military Academy. So was your high school, a military school? I went to, dude, I went, I had a great upbringing. I had a really fun high school and college. So I went to an all guys military Catholic high school ran by Benedictine monks, Benedictine in Richmond, Virginia. And then I went to community college for a year and I got into a few schools. I pretty much, I did the gap with community college in, in Richmond because I wanted to help take care of my grandpa who was sick at the time. And he was, we knew he didn't have a ton of time left and I care about family. So that was important to me to be there and support. And, uh, after that, I got into a few schools and my brother was already at Virginia military Institute. And I told my mom, I was like, well, I got in here, here and here. I think I'm going to go to this one. I think I'm just going to focus on bodybuilding and, you know, maybe go that route and do that, have fun, hang out with my friends, you know, maybe have a beer on the weekend, enjoy college life. My mom goes, all right, fine. You can do what you want. And when they give you that disappointment, she didn't have to say anything else. I was like, all right, I'll go to VMI. And mm -hmm. then so I ended up going there and, and, and going that whole route. So and how long did you stay there? 
I graduated from there. So you can't transfer in. Yeah. Once you go in, you start as a rat, a freshman, and, and go through the whole rat line and, and go through that. So I was there from 2009 to 2013. It, it sounds to me like you've moved around, not a lot, but more so than most, mm -hmm. right? So the, the question I would have, granted being a raw power lifter is different than the single ply because it's mm -hmm. a little easier to train by yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't have, some you don't have to have on. a team, yeah. But you're, you're still finding yourself in training environments or gyms where there's other people who are serious. Yes. You know, I, I paused on that. You'll see why in a minute. And so for damn near over a decade... Right, so that you've been around those people close enough to see what attributes mm -hmm. allow people to to become world record holders mm -hmm. or national level bodybuilders mm -hmm. and those that aren't. And when you're predominantly around those who say they're striving for, you know, then again, I'm choosing my words correctly, and then those that aren't, having been around those through say five or six different demographic locations even though they're still kind of close within proximity what are the things or the attributes that if you look back and think of those people like oh yeah i remember this guy you don't i don't want you to say who these people are i remember this guy that could have done this but he didn't or this guy that you know was making fun of you for all the bullshit that you were doing but he didn't or I remember this guy, he did all these. Th what are the attributes that propelled them forward and the attributes that propelled them to just stay basically loud mouths that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. never, I don't want to say never was type mm -hmm. of people because maybe they just choose differently. But during that time, the, during the time that you're around them, or at least yeah. I've been around them, yeah. they think that they're, this is their life and that they're all in. For yeah, that two yeah. months or whatever. Yeah, that's, dude, that's a good point. I mean, that was something else I had to learn along the way that I was so obsessed with training, with lifting, with the history of the sport. I know people that were good at lifting and didn't give an F about who set the record three years before them. Dude, I was studying like who was Paul Passanella? You know, who was Doug Furness? How was he a wrestler? And he was with giant quads. I'm like, mm -hmm. who are these guys, right? I'm a historian. I love it. I can't get enough. So I'm thinking, everyone's, everyone thinks that way. Everyone should think that way. And if you don't, I don't want to be around you. I don't want to be, you're, you're sucking energy from me. I don't want to mm -hmm. deal with that. Well, over time, I had to compartmentalize that I can still be that and then communicate and work with others that aren't necessarily there. Mm -hmm. So I would take, I would learn from everyone I was around, learn from the good and learn from the bad and take that and create a version of myself the best I could be. Trial and error for sure. But the biggest thing was I'm going to be absolutely my buddy calls me, he calls me lunatic Johnny when uh, we're getting ready to squat or when, when I start getting, you know, crazy about lifting, we're getting ready to train, like lunatic Johnny's coming out. He's a madman. But I had to be able to balance and learn that, you know, not everyone's going to be like that. So don't follow anyone too closely, but rather learn from them, whether it's good or bad. I mean, there might be someone who's, who's dicking around with the gym with, with tripods. I know nowadays everyone's mess with, everyone hates tripods and this and that but you know what i learned i was like hey maybe they're just doing it for social media maybe that's they got a, a home situation where this is helping them not go down a bad path mm -hmm. i'm gonna let him do his thing i'm not gonna get mad at that now if you're in a, a, a serious gym where you know you guys are you're getting in the way that's a different story yeah but if i'm training in a normal gym who am i to you know tell someone else you have to be a certain way or lift this way and that way. I think that's arrogant. I think that's stupid. So it was more the fact that instead of following others too closely, whether they were good or whether they were bad or world record holders or whoever they were, I just want to learn. I want to good and bad and then adjust it to myself and make myself the best I could. I saw it. I guess the, to reframe the question is if, if there's people that are listening mm -hmm. that want to get to that next level mm -hmm. 
and like how would how what what are the common things that you see that are holding most people back so i i would say through your the path the people you've directly seen throughout your okay. time that, okay. that that held them back well it's different now than it was 10 years ago and you know we were talking a little bit it's social media um we were talking about before this started about when Instagram was just photos. Yeah. And that wasn't even that long ago. It might've been 10 years ago. I didn't get an Instagram until after college and I was already on team USA by then and stuff like that. So I would say nowadays guys, I'm not saying you have to put down your phone while you train, record a top set, use it to focus on bar path. Was it a good lift? Don't use it to record Will this get likes? Will this get clicks? You're not going to achieve what you want to achieve with that mindset. There's a social media culture mindset, and that's fine. If that's your goal, then you can do that for sure. Then ignore what I'm saying. But if your goal is to be the best you can be, whether it's strength-wise, muscularity-wise, competition-wise, or even just losing 50 pounds, and that's really hard for you. Maybe you've got a little bit of thyroid issue. If that's your goal and you're serious about whatever you're doing, put the phone away listen to music find your music go in the gym guys sacrifice sacrifice 45 minutes to an hour right hour 15 and, you know if you got to train hour 30 hour 30 yeah. but sacrifice right make that little bit of sacrifice so that you can really achieve your goals maybe 10 years ago it was more don't you know i would say don't be arrogant learn from those before you and that's still relevant today it's funny, I've joked about this with people. It doesn't make me mad anymore, but there's a lot of people who you go up to them and, and they're powerlifting fans and they want to be good. And you say, you know, who, who do you think is the best of all time and this and that? Like, oh, uh, this guy. I'm like, I've only been lifting for like five years. You know? Well, it's funny, I saw someone post like a deadlift. Ooh, greatest deadlift of all time at 132 or something. Mm-hmm. Well, that was done by Lamar Gant 30, 40 years ago. If you really want to be the best, learn from those who came before you. Keep that respect for the generations that came before us. No matter who they are, no matter if you like, oh, well, they all used single ply suits and this and that. It doesn't relate. Man, you'd be surprised. Back then, everyone was deadlifting singlets. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think my best advice would be also don't get too much focused on the right now. Also, you can learn from things from the past, learn from the history, right? If we don't learn from history, we're bound to repeat it and make the same mistakes. Make sure that you study the sport, study whatever you're trying to do, learn as much as you can. Like I said, take the good and the bad from, from other people in the sport or at your gym. You know, if you're a bodybuilder, maybe try to find the biggest guy in the gym, see what he's doing. Uh, I'm not talking supplement wise, but his yeah. training style, this and that. Maybe he's, he's, wow, he's training one, two top sets. What's this high intensity interval stuff? What's this high intensity work? I've never heard of Casey Viator and Arthur Jones, the Nautilus, you know, learn from everyone. I think that's, that's the best advice I could. I think that you know. we've seen that happen. You know, if, if you look at the advancement in, you know, the bodybuilders of today, and you now people are going to criticize and all these things say they're not better than they were before. But mm -hmm. that shit's been going on since the 90s. Yeah. The, the, yeah. That conversation always happens. Like the greatest of all time debates always happen. So let's all those conversations that always happen, let's just set them aside because they're not relevant. Mm -hmm. They've always happened. So mm -hmm. it's stupid. But as a whole, the bodybuilders are better today, bigger, leaner than they were at any time before. The powerlifters are stronger today than they ever were before. Um, the straw men are probably better today than they ever were before. I, I say probably, I don't know that world very well, but I assume it is because yeah. pretty much all athletes across the board are better. Mm -hmm. The only way that they could possibly be better is by learning from the mistakes of those that came before them. Yes. Right. That's why they're better. And that's mm -hmm. why the ones that are coming up now should be learning from the ones today. Mm -hmm. You know, hopefully the ones today already learn from the mistakes of the ones that came before them. Hopefully. So there is a hack. You don't have to go and learn yeah. from the ones that were doing shit in the 50s and 60s. It's fun. You know, it's cool to see what was happening. But that that progression is what mm -hmm. leads and drives these sports into the future where the 
while focusing on what you what they have to get done now, yeah. right? Because it's other ones I think are trying to reinvent the wheel where that's probably okay. Mm-hmm. If they have a better risk benefit ratio to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. If if you're really close to a pro card and you're chasing a pro card, there's not a whole lot of fucking experimenting and reinventing the wheel you want to do at this point. No. You know, after the card maybe, right? Because you, you go you become yeah. you become the shittiest at the next level. Yeah, you, you have you have a brief <laughs> moment of, oh, I got my pro card. I've worked so hard for it, and then boom. Yeah. Yeah. Start over. Yes. Where it's the the closer people get to, and you've done it before in powerlifting, right? Mm-hmm. So with that, as you're playing around doing all this different shit, but after a while, you're like, you know what? This works. I got this much room to play around with, but I'm not changing yeah. fucking everything. No. You know, when you're on the brink of an all time world record total, people do, and that's where they fuck up because that's one of the biggest things that they haven't learned from. Yeah. Find out what works for you. Yeah. Everyone's different, you know, and I I talked about this a little bit while we were training, just because you see an exercise, right? So we all have different ranges of motion, different leverage. Some have a longer torso, shorter torso. Bar path is going to be different. You know, hip hinge is going to be different on certain movements. Find, yes, when you're coming up, try to experiment, see what works for you, but don't do a movement just because someone else does it. Right. If your knee starts tweaking or hurting or something, but you're, you know, well, so and so did this, you know, and I want to do that. Like, it might not work for you. Try to figure out what works for you. Write your own story. You know. How did you do that when you were powerlifting? As far as figuring out, you know, sumo conventional, squat stance, shit like that. So at the time, there was no Instagram, and Facebook was, you know, newer. The only person that uh, obviously watching Strongman, but the only person that I used to see pull sumo a lot was uh, Ed, Eddie. Modified. You know? Yeah, like the modified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah his, his knees were still like within the rings and stuff. But yeah, so that I was like, pull conventional. This feels right. And then over time after doing that, I realized my leverages were good. Like I had longer arms. Um there's certain things about my body I noticed, okay, this feels natural, this doesn't. Let me not try, well, everyone now is pulling sumo, but this works for me, right? And then when I've pulled sumo, I've had quite a few injuries and things like that and things tweaking and this and that. It doesn't feel right. I'm not stable and I've messed with, you know, wrestling shoes and this and putting my feet inches and out and working my adductor strength and, and mobility. I'm like, this, the conventional works for me, you know? With the powerlifting what methodology were you using towards what did you arrive on that worked the best for you more of a linear type of thing a conjugate mm-hmm. thing or a block type of thing i started doing 531 moved to uh, a west side conjugate for about a year and a half I, I don't think that if you do it for two months you ain't gonna get anything out of it mm-hmm. right it's something that you have to put some time into strength does not come overnight tendon ligament strength all that stuff does not come overnight Central nervous system activation doesn't come overnight. So I spent about a year and a half to two years on each one. I even messed with Shiko, Smolov, all of them. And then I found out, for me, I was more of a doubles, triples I started getting strong at. I noticed towards the end of my my peak, I would always get really strong with doubles and triples and do well at the meet. Then when, you know, I realized, okay, a lot of this extra volume I can do in the off season to grow, to build muscularity, for support in my lifting. But I found that I was a better responder, central nervous system wise and stuff, through doubles and triples. And the only way I found that out was through actually competing, because I wouldn't notice it until the last few yeah. weeks of my training, where I was like, boom, everything would just shoot up. All right, so you would spend the off season doing more hypertrophy work, more volume. And then yeah, twelve weeks out, you five start by five. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So twelve weeks out, you're starting the doubles and triples, but just lighter percentages. Yes, yes, and uh, back, back offsets. So how would the back offsets work? So, man, it wasn't that long ago, but it was a little bit ago. So I'm trying to think back. Let's say when I set my record, I would work up. Okay, let's say I finished, I missed 865, but I finished with an 832 pull at the end of the full meet. <clears throat> so the most I pulled to, to get to 832 was 800 for a single the whole time. 
you don't necessarily have to do in the gym what you do on the, I mean, if you're doing in the gym, what you're doing on the, the meet, then the platform you're sort of training wrong, right? Yeah. You're yeah. not peaking. Yeah. Okay. So the goal is to peak and hit a PR at the meet five, 10, 15, 20, 30 pounds, whatever. So that was my belief always. And, you know, I think Eddie used to say, and Steve used to say, save a little bit, leave a little bit in the tank. Mm -hmm. So that was the way I ran my training. A little bit old school, more linear periodization. Once I got to that point and learned everything and saw what worked for me. And then, so I would start out 12 weeks out, do harder movements. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, like I would do like, I would stand on a block or stand on um, right, a 45 yeah, plate yeah. and make that harder, the range of motion harder. I'd focus on heavy lockouts, but I would always do like a top set of triples. Maybe I'd do like five triples mm -hmm. and then four triples and three triples and then doubles and this and that. And I would just sort of cycle it that way. And then I would pull rack pulls out probably like four weeks out just because of how fatiguing they are. Um, and then I would just go like a triple top set. And then I would do like a down set of like 65, 70% sets of five or something. Um, uh, and that, that's pretty much how I do it. And then once I got close enough, like within the month, I'd probably drop that top, the, the drop down yeah. set, just hit the top set, work up, hit the top set, do my accessories, go home. So basically you ended up training the same way 90% of all powerlifters do. Exactly. Coming into the meet. And, the, and now in the off season, when off season, when, when it was more of the hypertrophy mm -hmm. phase, how did that look then? I, where I'm going to go is later we're going to talk Compared about how it looks building. now. Yeah, just how, how did it look for you then? Hypertrophy back then was more of a, there was no isolation of body parts. It was isolation of, of uh, bench, squat, and deadlift. So I'd probably do one or two movements of accessories with a high volume um, movement of my main compound and then do two or three accessories with abs, go home. And one of the things about that was I remember... This was towards the end of my powerlifting where I was getting crazy. And I remember, I think I did like a 775 triple, which was my top set. And my back down sets was I did 500 for five sets of 10 beltless stiff leg. <laughs> yeah, dude, that wasn't smart, but I could do it. Man, Goggins texted me the next day. What the hell are you doing? Man? Yeah, I see how you got fucked up. <laughs> well, so I did. I, this is a true story. This is a true story. I did 500 and on the last set of the 10th rep, I lift it, I put it down, and all of a sudden my back felt weak. And it wasn't, didn't pop. It just felt, my lower back felt weak. I drive home 30 minutes after we're done. I assume I'm good. I get in the shower, I can't bend over. And now I'm starting to get pain. I go out to eat with that at that time with my girlfriend at the time. I sit down in the booth, and it feels like my spine is grinding on itself. Uh-oh, man, something, something's wrong. And that's when I realized, okay, I'm getting so strong, I need to figure out my training again. I need to refigure out my training again. Now, I went to bodybuilding not long after that, but that's where my training was getting to at that point. It was getting sort of too much volume, too much. And um, luckily, it was just my disc was, or my uh, cervical was a little bit out of place. So the chiropractor popped it back in. Inflammation went down. I was good to go. All right, let's take a break real quick. Then when we come back, I'm going to talk about how you're training now compares mm -hmm. to how it did then and how it's evolving now cool so we'll be right back i want to let you guys know that we just had a limited edition drop on the website last week of new items that sweatshirt flannel t-shirts shorts basically the limited edition items are the items that directly support the table talk podcast so if you go to elitefts.com backslash limited edition, or actually just the link in the description, you can find the limited edition items that we have now, which there's the one that I like the best is the shit suck good great, which is all emojis. The designs I always like the best, right? They're the ones that don't sell for shit, you know, but they're the ones that I want to wear that I like the best. And there's the, there's the cigar one as well. And they're all there on the screen for you guys to be able to see. So if you go to EliteFTS.com backslash limited edition, the other thing that directly helps support the podcast that I haven't talked that much about is the Table Talk crew 
the Table Talk crew is extra edition episodes that go out once a month. The content of those episodes are AMA related, quest related that come from the Table Talk Discord group, which is also part of being in the crew. When you're in the crew, there's dozens of eBooks that are in there. There's every seminar that we've ever done is put on there. There's courses that are put on there. There's series that have put on there. The original YouTube channel that we had for many years that we, before we migrated to the newer one, all that old content is on there. There's discussion groups for just general training, fitness, life, nutrition, basically everything that you can think of is on. So just go look at what that is, or better than that, just go to the description, click on join the crew that helps directly support the podcast, which is how we're able to keep this thing rolling. Americ Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to AmericHealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them, which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash Table Talk. The discount code is Table Talk. Today's episode is brought to you by First Detachment. Are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hardworking athletes? Look no further than First Detachment. 1D's real world experience is what I would consider and they consider battle tested. I have known Justin Harris for pretty close to two decades. And if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. If you guys have followed me and have followed the podcast, you pretty much already know how I feel about the supplement industry. For me to get behind any brand, I have to trust the brand and I have to trust the person both. And I'm pretty sure you guys all know why. When it comes to creating formulas and putting products on the market, and there's nobody that I trust more than Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH first. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code TABLETALK10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate. We are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. Uh, I love that. <laughs> okay, we're back. Where I want to go here now is we were just talking off air a little bit about accessory, not accessory training, but bodybuilding type of training. Is I heard in one of the podcasts that you were on talking about how your training differs a little bit now more technically not on what we were just talking about as far as training movements because i i'm pretty sure at least i hope the listeners of this show understand there's a difference between training movements and muscles so i'm going to assume that that's already covered that they get that where when you start training muscles that it's more about 
getting that full range of motion, getting the stimulus to the muscle to be able mm -hmm. to grow. So as you've gone through this bodybuilding career, how the first change was probably radical. Yeah. Right. Because what would that first iteration look like when it was just all bodybuilding training without the focus on movements? So I would say after my first show in 2017, I trained, you know, obviously was training bodybuilding at that point, but I was still focused on the big three, whether it was, uh, whether it was a barbell bench or a dumbbell flat bench, a deadlift, I'd always throw deadlifts in there because I just couldn't get rid of them. I just loved them. Heavy squats, things like that. And I was like, I'm not really seeing the growth that I should be seeing from changing up my style of training and getting those like newbie gains. And then so, man, it took me almost a year to learn that in bodybuilding, you know, let me say this, in powerlifting, you're going from A to B. How can we make it move the strongest, the fastest from A to B? In bodybuilding, it's everything in between. So it took me a while to learn control. I think the best way, if you are trying to move more from a power aspect, an explosive aspect, into a muscle building hypertrophy aspect, is to slow the movement down. Try to keep it one speed, more of a control. You know, now if you have an explosive movement, that's fine. But I'm just speaking to guys trying to learn how to really build the most muscle and get the most hypertrophy. So slow the movement down to one speed, get a full lengthening in the muscle, and then a full contraction. Squeeze, you'd be surprised. You know, there's a lot of movements that try a pec deck or try, you know, a pec fly or something. Do the motion, just normal, A to B. Then take a full stretch, hold it for a half a second, come up, squeeze as hard as you can, like your pecs are gonna pop off your chest, squeeze it, hold it for a half second, then try to do eight or nine more reps, and you're gonna be like, man, I'm smoked, my chest is pumped beyond belief. Try that, I think that was the biggest change in learning how to train, it took me almost a year. That's a tough one, because when I have the clinics, I, I try to teach strength athletes how to train their accessories this way. Because yes. it makes no sense to me if it's the fifth exercise of a day, like a side raise. Yeah. Like, why are you muscle fucking it? It makes no sense to me. It's, yes. it's counterproductive. It's not going to develop the muscle. But what I have found over the last five years is one of the problems with what you're talking, you can get them to understand what you're saying and almost be there. But then it always turns into a mess. Mm -hmm. And I think what that was from the people that I've worked with, they get fixated on a number. Like I'm supposed to do 10. Okay. You I see, see what I'm that. saying? So if they're doing what, what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. And it might fade off and just be done at eight, but they're not yes. cool with that. So they, they muscle fuck it to get to 10, where to me, it's like, man, you're just kicking the can down the road. Mm -hmm. Actually, in my mind, you're kind of training then past failure because yeah. you already kind of hit it. And now you just want two more reps through. And so I try to get them to remember with the old programs that you would find in, um, early internet her magazines and yeah. shit like that it would say like three sets of 10 to three 15 by, yeah yep and you're like what the fuck is 10 by 15 <laughs> and now you know we got it i think a lot of the people got it that means mm -hmm. that you're gonna you're gonna be done somewhere between there yes but a lot of people in today's world that is it 10 is it 11 is it 12 it's like the range yeah and um are you seeing the same thing with people that you're training with uh, or not as it's stupid it the training is what you are. Yeah, and, and that's probably the hardest thing when you are coaching people. I do I do have clients and stuff under my team and people are just doing the movement. And like you said, so being able to not only control, slow it down, but there are certain movements that people, man, I would say, like like barbell bench press. Right, some people might be just completely focused on that the whole time, um, but then they got to realize, like, hey, when we're doing accessories or certain things, that's not going to hit the way we want to hit it. Right, that's going to limit range of motion, and squeezing, and contraction, all that stuff. So, you know, going back to what you said, and and I think that the failure aspect of it is misconstrued, and it's just not understood because when the RPE system started becoming popular. I see guys online saying, 
they get pumped. They do a lift. It looks good. RPE 8. RPE 7. But they're not being realistic. And then they get a death grinder. You know, we call them the death grinders or he's getting stapled or whatever it is. And then it, they say, mm, RPE 8.5, whatever. <laughs> Because you don't want to say RP10. <laughs> that tells your competition that that's your max. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you don't yeah, want to release yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it, uh, ego sort of comes into it. So RPE is great. I use it for a lot of accessory movements, but my main movements, you know, I try to tell them, I don't, most of the time I'll give them a number, but I'll write in there, hey, this is the failure point, right? So this is, I need you to be at failure. At 10, that means I need to have, you need to have someone spotting you. That t puts in their mind, okay, this is like all out failure. Or if I tell them, hey, I want you to have, you know, what people say like an RP eight or something. I want you to have two to three in the tank where you can, you're going to failure, but you can get it on your own, right? So I sort of have to make sure I tell people that. Otherwise they think eight to 10. Oh, boom, 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 boom. I did eight to 10. I did 10. Yeah. Like, no, I want you to go to you know, a positive failure at 10. So sometimes I have to explain it a little more where go to failure as if you have someone spotting you, otherwise you're not going to get it. Then it starts to click with them. Once you started to figure this out, you know, my muscle connection, whatever you want to call that, mm -hmm. what happened to your physique? Was it noticeable after Completely the next? Completely noticeable. It changed, it changed so, it changed fast. Um, I would say weaknesses started to develop. Um, Things like shoulders just started growing, upper chest just started taking off, and me and Justin joked about it. My first show with him in 2021 in March, I had already been working with him for about eight months at the time, and we were like, okay, you know, we're gonna do well, but you know, I may sort of have those quads that come like straight up and down, and in bodybuilding, that's it's okay, but you want to have a little bit of that sweep on the outside, and. Over time, I'm still, I'm not, you know, I haven't been in bodybuilding for 20 plus years, so I was still developing movements that worked for my range of motion the whole time. And then I started developing, you know, the quad shape and stuff like that, and I figured out what worked for me. And, you know, it's sort of funny because we had just assumed that at that point, oh, my genetics are just, I'm going to look a certain way. But then we were able to find certain movements and, and continue to figure out my training that helped them. You know, and I told Justin, I was like, I think it was this, this, and this that did that. He's like, dude, whatever it is, just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. so. When when you say figure it out, are you? do you mean how it feels while you're doing it? I would say I do a movement. I do a movement for about a month or two, maybe a little bit less. And I take photos, right? Whether I'm sending them to my coach or I don't have to be like posing like crazy, but I'll take photos at home. Or I'll take photos doing a certain, of, of a certain angle of my leg or something of that sort. And then if I notice, I'm sort of weird like it, where if I notice, okay, my outer quad, it looks like there's a slight raise on my outer head when I bend my knee. I'm so weird that I'll look at that and keep looking at it for weeks on end. And if it looks different, then I know that exercise is working. If I look at it and I'm like, well, the inner head of my quad, you know, is growing more than the lateralis and in the medialis. And I'm just so weird where I'll use pictures to see if the exercise is working. But on top of that, I'll just pay attention to it. And I'll look at my body. We all know, no one knows our bodies or our training better than we do. So we know if we have a certain weakness, someone might see it and be like, no, that looks like a strong point on you. But you know, hey, I've got to work on this how your clothing feels, your strength. If your strength is not increasing on certain movements, no matter how hard you train them, it's probably not the best movement for you. If, you, if you're doing it correctly, right? If you're not doing it right, we got to fix it. But if you're doing the movement correctly and you're not progressing in muscularity and or strength, you might have a better, another movement that might be better for you in those aspects. What's going through my mind while you're saying all that is, you know, the, the first thing was, well, that could depend upon how much glycogen you have in your legs at the time. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, what's your nutrition is like at the mm -hmm. time, what, what, what you're fucking taking at the time. Yeah. Like, so you have to balance all those factors yes. into the images as well. And, and that's why I don't care what I look like, or I don't care the progress I make during prep muscularity. Yeah, wise. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I always, because, you know, you're taking more things and cutting down. 
<laughs> you look better, leaner. You look more muscular. You look bigger on stage, 30 pounds less, you know, than you would in the off season, 30 pounds more. Well, I, my clothes fit tighter and this and that. Yeah, but if you're on stage, the leaner you look, the bigger you're going to look. So <laughs> anything with prep, I don't even take into account. So all my focus is during the off season on what's going to work. And normally in the off season, I'm running, you know, like a testosterone and, and, and like an EQ or MPP and that's it. Right. Um, and that way I'll know, Hey, run the same stuff. I'm training the same amount of intensity, but I'm not going to give myself like two weeks to figure it out. I'm going to give my, I'm going to do this exercise and kill myself with it for two months. That seems to be about the amount of time between six to eight weeks where I can see if something's working or not. Right, I get it. So you're controlling that baseline. Controlling it, yeah. Okay, yeah, right. yeah. And then what about the nutritional side <clears throat> in the off-season? I mean, there's going to be some fluctuations, but is that <coughs> baseline being – so let's say your intra workout, your pre-workout, all mm -hmm. that, is that the same throughout most of the off-season, or does that change yes. as well? Yeah, so if you – I mean, obviously, if you have a coach, he's he or she is going to be hopefully looking at you and paying attention and adjusting yeah. so that you can – hopefully keep the same amount of body fat percentage. Therefore, our insulin sensitivity and other things are going to remain high and we're going to be good with that and digestion is going to be good. So hopefully they're watching you, not getting you too fat or out of shape. Um, so that being a controlled variable, I would say it's extremely important to, it's, I don't want to sound like it's being vain, but you have to be like hard on yourself. Yeah. And you have to be realistic. None of us want to admit what our faults are. None of us want to admit that we have a certain weak body part that might not be the best or, man, I just have to work harder than other people in my deadlift. I've got short arms and I don't want to admit that though. I'm just as strong as that guy. I know I work harder than him. So my best advice is taking time to figure, once again, figure like we've been talking about figuring what works for you, but being realistic and not letting that ego get in the way, you know, sort of hitting those weaknesses and so what is the, so as the bodybuilding journey has continued, how has the training evolved from that first year? You know, as far as if it's training density or the volume off season stuff. So let's just go off season, forget off season would be less, less volume overall, but more intensity. <clears throat> and I'm not talking powerlifting intensity. I had, when I first started, I had to do a bunch of volume just to figure out how this movement feels. I go from powerlifting. I've got rack pulls. You know, you got your accessories, mm -hmm. and, you know, this and that, overhead press, blah, 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 box squats, bands, chains. Now I have a gym full of a million different movements I have to do. I got to figure out what works. So when I first started, it was volume crazy. Four, five sets of squats, drop set, super set, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And now it's more two top sets, Control, not necessarily a Dorian high intensity where it's one set, but more of a two top sets, maybe one drop set. And I don't push everything to failure. I don't push everything to failure, but I push it pretty close to where once I'm done with those two top sets, I don't think I have another, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> I'm not saying I can't do another rep, but it's not going to be, if say I've got trying to do three sets between eight to 12, I'm probably not going to hit eight, mm -hmm. right? And I do like to keep the volume between eight to 12. Whether my failure set is at eight or whether that's 12, it's fine. That eight to 12 for me seems to work well. So I'll do, okay, two top sets, eight to 12. Whether, you know, with powerlifting, you normally have a set goal for that day. With bodybuilding, it can fluctuate. Maybe you had less sleep. Maybe it's a low day. on You're, you're dropping carbs a little bit. I got to lean out a little bit. I'm used to doing 150s for eight. You go in the gym, they ain't moving that way. In powerlifting, you'd probably get upset and probably have to find a way to, to make sure you hit that number. In bodybuilding, all right, what can I hit today that's going to go to failure with correct form in eight to 12? And it's going to be 120s today. All right, let me bench 120s today. That's a good workout. With powerlifting, if I didn't do what I was supposed to do, it's probably a bad workout. Are you using strength as a gauge or your pump as a gauge or a mixture of both? I'm using the point of failure as a gauge. So if I know, like for instance, for me, if I go 
that eight to 12, whether it's a hundred pound dumbbell or 200 pound dumbbell, as long as I can get to that point of failure and get all the reps and squeeze, it's a good workout. I'm not concerned if it's, oh, well, I only did a hundred pound dumbbell today or 125. You're not going to be able to gain five, 10 pounds on every lift every week for the rest of your life. You're going to have weeks where you might not have as much glycogen in your system. You might have traveled. Anything could happen, sleep, whatever. So my whole focus is focusing on that failure point, making sure I'm controlling and contracting the muscle to failure within that given rep range, no matter what the weight is. I'm going to, obviously, if it's light that day, I'm going to be able to do more reps, right? So I got to go heavier. But if it's too heavy, I can't get the reps. I got to go lighter. So whatever the weight is, as long as I can go to failure between those, that rep scheme that works for me, I'm good for the day. So how do you base the number of those repetitions you're going to have per body part on a day? So over time, for my, I'm speaking for myself. Yes. I've found out that high, higher volume sets of 15 for body parts like shoulders and smaller body parts seems to do better. Short rest periods. People come up to me, and I had a couple clients recently say, I cannot get a pump in my shoulders to save my life. Well, I made them shorten the rest period, increase some of the reps, more control, not as much swinging, and they said it's the best pump they've ever had. I didn't change any of their, any of their exercises. I just changed those simple things. So smaller body parts, shorter rest periods. You're going to keep that pump. You're going to keep the intensity. You're going to be able to push that, that skeletal tissue to failure. Larger body parts, for me personally, 8 to 12, two top sets, maybe a back down set or a drop set. They grow the best that way. I'm asking more about the total uh, movements and so say if it's mm -hmm. chest, there's four exercises. Okay. Too, so the eight total sets. So where do you know that another exercise shouldn't be when done? I, when I stop losing the pump, okay. which I found out over time, which is around the fifth exercise for me. I yeah. usually plan for about five exercises, I would say between... 15 sets total to 20 so it's more higher volume mm -hmm. but then some days it could be 12 sets right i'm still not changing that 8 to 12 reps yes. but the sets may vary i may only do two sets like if i'm in prep i'm maxing out at two sets if i'm volume uh, off season i may do three sets with a drop set so once i'm in the gym past like an hour and a half or it's pretty much at this point on the dot, I'll start losing my pump at like an hour and a half. And then I start, you know, my mind starts wandering or, you know, I'm just tired and I, I can't even, I pretty much get to the point where I don't feel like I want to be in the gym anymore. How you know? many body parts then are you doing? Let's say if it's chest, shoulders and triceps mm -hmm. all in one day, then you're not going to start to lose your pump because the chest pump is just going to blend into the shoulder and the tricep next. Yeah, I would, I would say for me personally, I, the, the most I'll do is I'm sort of more of a bro split. I've done the, the squat. I mean, I'm sorry, the um, press pull legs, yeah. push pull the power legs. Power lifter never goes away, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've done the squat. <laughs> but yeah, so I've done push pull legs and different variations of that. And I, I couldn't feel it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't feel when I had to leave the gym because I had a pump. But then one day I was doing less volume, more intensity. So I wasn't really getting the pump that day anyway. So I'm like, I got lost, right? And over time, it started beating me up after a couple of weeks. So I'm like, okay, that was fun to switch it up. But then I went back to more of the bro split and I'm in tune with my body. I know when I start losing the pump, I start, you know, get your ass out of the gym, go eat. I know when I hit that fourth to fifth exercise, if I've pushed everything to the point I need to push it for in training, I'm not making it past that fourth, fifth exercise, even right. if I wanted to. So the bro split, you're speaking more one exercise or one body part per day. Yes. Like a chest day, a back day, arm day, yeah. shoulder if, day, leg day. You know, you throw calves in there a couple yeah, times yeah, a week, yeah. abs. Okay. If you've got an arm weakness, maybe take, have your own arm day, but maybe throw a tricep with a certain movement and a bicep with a certain movement, just so you keep them active. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you don't want to overtrain arms, guys. If you overtrain arms, they aren't going to grow. I've tried three days a week, four days a week. It didn't work. When you find that perfect split for you, just keep them active during the week, touch them up during the week, and then hit them hard on the weekend or whatnot. Um, you know, that, that's how you could do sort of more than one body part in a day. But if you're, if you're hitting... You know, and, and a lot of guys who do push pull legs, which I've done before, you know, they may be like, well, I do, you know, 
different movements or different, you know, shoulders and chest and back in the day and stuff like that. You're pretty much doing like maybe two movements per yeah. body part. And for me, as someone who responds to a higher volume, it doesn't work for me. Well, that's just, that's kind of why I put the line of questioning in there for that because if you're you're using you're using strength as a guide, right? Mm -hmm. On the on the yeah the the volume per set, right? W with good form, mm -hmm. but then you're using the pump as the guide to be able to shut it down. Yeah, where that works very very well. You know, you can auto regulate that very very well mm -hmm. with chest and maybe triceps if you have like mm -hmm. one one or two movement. But when you, you have that the chest shoulders triceps that becomes mm -hmm. very hard for somebody to learn how to auto regulate it's hard yeah right because of what i just said if well if the pump like ah you know because now if you're if you're using the chest as the guide what the fuck are the triceps even going to do because you're too shot yeah. from all that pressing to where there is there's value in this pro split just from what you're talking yes. about is it allows you to learn how to auto regulate the volume, mm -hmm. the effort, mm -hmm. you know, intensity to me, like yourself, it's powerlifting because of, you know, percentages yeah. and shit, but the volume, and then the frequency is where it becomes a little tricky, mm -hmm. right? Because now it's like once a week per body part, yeah. kind of, but not really, because mm -hmm. you're back, you're kind of training your biceps and, yeah. you know, it's, it, there's kind of crossover mm -hmm. with that. And so with, so now with that in mind, d do your do your does your nutrition on the bigger body part days or your intra mm -hmm. or your training nu or, mm -hmm. or tr nutrition change yes 100 percent. I, I think that when i do right now i'm i pretty much do two high days on my hardest movements um and i'm not worried so much about strength so i don't need to load up the day before but more the day of for growth and so what i'll, I'll, I'll do <clears throat> on my high days i'll do like 50 grams of a of a intra carb um, like a highly branched cyclic dextrin, what I use field rations from first attachment, and it's got EAAs in there. So I use it all during my training. So that's two scoops, then, right? Two scoops, yeah. yeah. Um, l just to talk about that last point, like you said, with the auto regulation is hard. I think with like a like a chest, shoulder, tricep, like a push pull legs, I find that people are either going too hard. Or too soft right it's yes. hard to it's hard to figure out and nail it every single time um but yeah with the nutrition side of things right now in the off season for me i found that two high days is a sweet spot with high days which means my carbohydrates are much higher my fats are lower and you know my protein's sort of a little bit lower i don't need to you know push my body as hard with the protein so the high day would be before the leg day or on the leg day on the leg day okay. so it works a little better if you're if you're training for strength guys and you really want to you know, be as strong as you can on that day, eat those high carbs the day before, uh, you know, you see marathoners and stuff, they're eating pasta and stuff the day before they're doing it right. Push those carbs in the day before, have them fully loaded in your glycogen. And, you know, you'll be, you'll be pretty strong that day, but for growth, you know, and Justin Harris do a great job explaining this, but you know, I'll push those high carbs the day of, um, I'll feel some pump from the carbs that day, uh well but, what time are you training of the day normally i'm an afternoon trainer all right so you're getting three maybe at least four three meals, meals. Yeah, yeah i don't train before three meals yeah, yeah. before the intro right so yes. three meals before so actually the intro would be four kind of yeah kind of yeah yeah mm -hmm. and then back would be the other high day yeah so right now it's quads and back more focused on i got the spinal erectors from deadlifting from powerlifting so I had to build more of the lower lat, which no one in the world is born with lower lats. You have to work for them. So some people just get them faster than others, but that was been a goal, getting the lower lats. So that was something I had to push more carbs and, and try to train a little bit harder and you know a little bit more food. If I did high carbs every day, I'd run into the issue where I'd lose insulin sensitivity. I'd start to put on too much adipose tissue and body fat, and I just wouldn't absorb food well. And so what I do is I have a certain amount of high carb days, certain amount of regular training day carbs, and I'll probably throw in a low day on my off day just to keep my insulin sensitivity up. I'll be starving that day, but you're not going to lose muscle mass in a day, right? As long as you're eating your protein, still getting a few carbs in and, you know, some fats in, you're not going to, you're not going to lose muscle in one mm -hmm. day. Now off season, do you keep any cardio in at all? Yeah, I would do right now. It's not super intense. It's about 
if you have a treadmill, it's like 3.0 on mm -hmm. the treadmill. I do about 20 minutes in the morning, just fasted. I just like waking up, rolling to my guest room and just, you know, doing some fasted cardio. It sort of speeds up my metabolism. I didn't used to be a morning person with food. Sometimes if my sleep was off, I would not be hungry. Um, I almost have to wait like an hour before I could eat. But I found that, you know, using my CPAP, getting better sleep, but also hitting a little bit of cardio in the morning got me hungrier. Mm -hmm. So I could pound that meal. How heavy were you able to push body weight wise your off season last before the last year before the Arnold? I would say I was probably about the same. I wasn't, I made a push to 300 a couple of years ago, but it was sloppy. Yeah. It wasn't good. And, uh, blood pressure was probably up certain things. I remember feeling lightheaded when I tied my shoes and stuff, but probably 275 at the peak last year. And I'm probably low two eighties right now, but I still can see my obliques and abs. So, um, much better shape, much better condition, which will make prep easier when we start it. And when's the next prep or when's the August? Next show? So August. August we'll start prep and for nationals in December. Okay. December. The with there there's other differences between um the powerlifting and the bodybuilding. So the training we talked about, the nutrition you were it's definitely different because you're carb cycling and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. you weren't eating like shit when you were powerlifting either. It was half no. like shit. So yeah, was was there? And I'm, I guess the reason I'm bouncing around my words right now is I assume the nutrition was not a hard thing for you to to get used to when it came to the bodybuilding, or was it? I'm I, actually it might have been harder than what I'm thinking. It's probably harder than what you were thinking. <laughs> The only reason I'm saying that is because when I was coming out of high school, I was 165 pounds at 5'9". Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I was benching 315 or whatever, but it took a lot of food to get, you know, I just would eat, 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 mm -hmm. eat. I remember after community college, I'd get out of class, I'd go to McDonald's, and this is when the dollar menu was a dollar menu. Yeah, I remember that. Not a dollar fifty menu. <laughs> and so I would get, okay, let's see if I remember. I would get two to three double cheeseburgers. I would get a Big Mac large with large fries, a yogurt parfait. Uh, the, McFlurry, the, the McFlurry machine was always broken, so I don't count that. Um, and then I would get, they had like chicken snack wraps yeah. back time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would get two or three of those. I would eat that, then go train, like right after, like 20 minutes later. And I didn't feel sick at all. So that sort of was, man, I'm, I'm giving away a, a secret here. When I was at VMI and I, I started I put that 300 pounds on my squat within a year, I would be eating cheeseburgers, like warming up for squat. Mm -hmm. Like while I was warming up, people didn't know how I did it, but I just digest food and it, it burns so fast through me. So I have to be careful of, you know, I'm a little bit older now, but if I don't eat enough, I become flat and stringy and lose a lot of strength pretty fast. So getting used to a more strict bodybuilding diet, it wasn't hard, right? Over time, I got used to it. But Justin knows, working with me now, that, uh, you know, I've got to have my pancakes. I've got to have certain things in the off-season that I can still digest. But if I don't get those extra calories in, I can only eat, you know, 1,200 grams of clean carbs so often before my jaw starts hurting and stuff. Yeah. Sometimes I got to throw a cheat meal in there. I got to throw a cheeseburger in there and stuff just to be able to get those calories in. And uh, especially while I'm growing. So that's, it, it wasn't difficult, but it wasn't super easy mm -hmm. getting more strict. With the, 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 now the PEDs changed a lot, right? Yeah, because, right. Dude. So they're, they're, yes. they're, 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 I mean, that's a whole conversation there. <laughs> that right? is, yeah. So you're, you're going from, I'm going to assume just straight anabolics, mm -hmm. test, trend, shit like that mm -hmm. when you were powerlifting and then into the mm -hmm. bodybuilding world, which is mm -hmm. a whole different fucking game. I would say that my blood work was always good. Um, I got my echocardiogram last year and it was, it, the doctor told me, I was looking at the screen when they were doing it. And if anyone doesn't know, it's like pretty much similar to when you're getting like a, a scan on your kid, your wife's belly and stuff. It pretty much looks like that on your mm -hmm. heart. And I asked her, I'm at this point, I'm assuming with everything I've done with powerlifting and whatnot, just being an athlete in general and training hard, all right, there's got to be some, uh, you know, hypertrophy, mm -hmm. my left atrium, things like that. And she showed me, she's like, you have none. She's like, you need to call your parents and thank them, you know, for your genetics mm -hmm. and stuff. So I was, I was, I've been safe with things. 
using performance enhancing drugs. I've been very safe. Whether people want to believe it or not, that's up to them. I don't really care. But when I was powerlifting, it was more test. You only did stuff 12 weeks out. Like I would stay on test, like a low dose test. Mm -hmm. And then when you get about 12 weeks out, you ramp it up. You add in orals maybe six weeks out, seven weeks out. I would never go above like 50. I think maybe two weeks out, I'd go like 100 D-ball or 100 Androl. For like, milligrams. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just putting it out there because yeah, the maybe is going to say you take Yeah, you know, but that might have been for like a week or two, yeah. right? But I was pretty much always 50 milligrams. No, but if they're 50 milligrams and you're taking 100 of them. 100 milligrams, yeah. Not 100. <laughs> that, that, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Somebody's going to clip this that shit. That would take 100 And pills. say he's taking 100 D-balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's not. That was, I'd be dead now. But, um, but, you know, I took, I found what worked for me mm -hmm. in powerlifting, but it was basic. You know, no growth hormone, no insulin, nothing like that. It was just straight. When you started prepping for the competition, you threw Trent in maybe seven, eight weeks out. I think uh, I saw some crazy stuff. I'm not going to say the individual. He's my boy. But he had to learn a lesson because at one point he took, oh, my gosh, it was like 2,000 milligrams of Trent the week before the meet. And it didn't end up well for him. He didn't bench a PR. You think? So, you know, we learned yeah. afterwards, like, hey, don't, you know, you don't need to do that. But Well, my question would be, what was it the week before that week? A thousand? Probably a thousand. Probably wow. 800, something like that. So, use, I would say that when powerlifting, guys use more basic compounds, but heavier dosages, mm -hmm. right? Just basic stuff, heavier dosages. And then when you transition to bodybuilding, I felt like it became, I, I used less. I use less, and I say that because you have like a testosterone base, and then you would use things like an MPP. Like in the off season, you use like an MPP or an EQ. Some guys use DECA, but sometimes they get a little bit high blood pressure from that. Um, everyone reacts differently. I'll just say that first off. So we're all like a chemistry set. Yeah. No one does the same thing. But I, you know, for instance, I would do like a like a test and EQ, and as long as my RBC and hematocrit stay good. I'm just running that, you know, medium 500 EQ or something in the off season and, you know, 500 test or something, which is still high. But when you're trying to become an open bodybuilder, you can't do, let's say the, the you know, the, the 60 year old guy walking on the treadmill next to you at the gym is doing 200 a week. If you want to be big Rami, you're not running 200 a week. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 500 test, 500 EQ and, you know, n you can do like orals. I would just do like an Anavar for like four weeks in the off season, take six to eight weeks off. When I was bodybuilding or powerlifting, Anavar wasn't a thing, man. It was just D ball or Anadrol, you mm -hmm. know, maybe Halo the last week, but there was no Anavar. So now a less hepatoxic drug, Anavar, throw it in for four weeks, uh, make sure I pay attention to my insulin levels much closer take my berberine, my suppressor first attachment, keep those levels in check, my blood glucose in check, absorb food. I'm more focus, focused on absorbing food, mm -hmm. right? And the drugs sort of help that. Whereas with powerlifting, it was more drugs were making me strong those last 12 weeks. And so when I start prep, you want, the, the biggest advice I could give people is you don't want to take a crazy amount of stuff. Now you're going to use a lot of different compounds to harden at lower dosages, right? But you're going to mix them all together to create a concoction that can make you harder and drier and, and look like granite going into the show. But you don't want to take too much as a bodybuilder because what happens if you take too much? Your kidneys might start, they might stop reacting as well. And what happens if your kidneys aren't working as well? If your kidneys skyrocket, the numbers, well, you're going to start holding water and there's nothing you can do to get that off. Maybe start taking a diuretic daily, but then you got other issues. So people may think that, oh, guys are abusing a ton of stuff. It's really not. For bodybuilding, it's basically like a test, an EQ, and some growth hormone. Um, guys vary it from, you know, three IUs up to 10. Uh, I'm not going to say what other people do. And, you know, and then some guys might mess with a little bit of IGF-1. Some do, some don't, just because they're maybe a little bit afraid of, possible cancer causing issues maybe they had some cancer in their family they don't even want to they didn't want to go down that path yeah um so mostly in bodybuilding it'll be like a, a hgh a test another 
compound, um, maybe an oral every couple months just for a few weeks, uh, maybe push insulin on high days. Some guys really believe in that. That's pretty much it with bodybuilding. And then, you know, you take a little bit of Winstrol, um, you know, a few things. You, you cut certain long esters out in bodybuilding, and then you start adding shorter esters in and, and Winstrol and things that will, like, harden you up. Because I don't care about being strong on stage. I care about looking good. So I just have to be hard and granity and look good on stage. The, the difference, as I saw it, is, you know, and the strength side, it's just you just take the shit. To recovering it strong there's that's it there, there's not a whole lot of thought that most people are putting no. into it no. it's like fuck i'm a little behind i need to take more i'm doing okay i don't need mm -hmm. to take anymore mm -hmm. bodybuilding it seems like it's this strategic there's synergistic, more of a reason. yes yeah you know where it's it's all synergy but then it has to work with the the nutrition the mm -hmm. nutrition it has to exactly complement so yep. all this shit has to be put together like a yeah. puzzle yeah as opposed to man, I took 50 D ball last time a week. Let me try a hundred this time. Maybe. Yeah. And then your deadlift goes up another 20 pounds PR. You're like, well, shoot, that worked. Yeah. Let me keep that in as opposed to bodybuilding where it's more, okay, my blood glucose is good with this amount of GH. If I raise my GH, is that going to hurt my blood glucose, my insulin sensitivity so that I'm not going to absorb food more? It, you know, it's more, things have to work together. Like you said, it's more, yeah. not just, I just want to get stronger. You know, how often are you getting your labs checked? Uh, I would say at this point, definitely after shows, after shows, um, like I said, I just got my echocardiogram, which was a little bit of a pain because I had to go through a primary and then, but I just told him like, Hey, I'm in my thirties. Let me get it done. You know, I've been an athlete, whatever I've used um, performance enhancing drugs and stuff. And so they let me get it pretty easy. Mm -hmm. It just took a few weeks to get an appointment. Um, but labs definitely after every show at this point, you know, I'm not going to go completely off testosterone and things like that. Even if I, am done with bodybuilding, I'll probably still have to run just a low dose. So probably after every show I do, which this year will be twice, and then maybe once or twice in between. I mean, I don't want to lie and say, oh, I get them done every month. Like, no, nah, probably like midpoint in off season before we start prep, mm -hmm. just to see where levels are at. If, hey, you know, let's wait a little bit longer. My body needs more time to recover. Luckily, I've been pretty good with certain things and liver and kidneys are a-okay and well, that was that. This, one of the secondary questions I have with that is, you know, Merrick Health is one of the sponsors of the podcast. So, guys, link is in the bio. If you need your labs, we have a full panel lab, and we also have the checkup labs, which are in there as well. And there's a commercial that we run, so there's information on that. But you can work with a – you can either just get the labs done or work with somebody that can help walk you through all the labs. But – the, the, the point that I wanted to make with a lot of people that just get their labs done, and there's multiple ways you can get your labs done. I mean, Merrick will give you a report and lay all this other shit out, is the question I have for most is, so what exactly are you going to do with them after you get them? Right. So you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I like post show kind of makes sense. Like yes. post meet makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. okay, let's see how bad. How we, much damage did I do? Yeah. Let's see how bad we fucked this up. Yeah. You know, the one that never made sense to me was like, eight weeks 10 weeks post show mm -hmm. or post peak like i need to get everything really really good before i do my labs like that's mm -hmm. dumb as fuck you know what <laughs> you know what it is dave it's people we know what we're doing and it's hard to sometimes to be like i don't want to hear the truth i don't i don't mm -hmm. out of sight out of mind mm -hmm. whether it's I don't want to go get this injury checked. I'm just going to keep training through it, take ibuprofen and tape it up, throw an extra squat suit on, knowing full well you might have to stop lifting like that, or whether it's with blood work. And because sometimes the blood work may mean, hey, you can't do nationals this year. I know you wanted your pro card, but you need some time to get that liver in check. Yeah. See, that would scare me, though, if, if it was me going – you know, train for the nationals. Then fourteen weeks out, mm -hmm. I'm getting. I'm like, fuck that. I am not getting my labs fourteen weeks out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because all... I don't want to have that conversation. <laughs> Look, at the end of the day, and, and I'll say this too, right? If you, if your blood levels are too high, your androgen response is not going to be as good. So, guys, mm -hmm. get your mm -hmm. blood work done. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you've got good blood, clean blood, not an overabundance of blood, and your RBC and hematocrit yeah. is too high. Make sure that you donate blood when you need to. You keep everything in check because at the end of the day 
if certain organs and things aren't working right or you got too much blood in there trying to pump through those veins, your angiogram response is not going to be as good. No, that's so, a great point. Make sure you, it's worth doing it, guys, not only for health, but also your gear is going to work better. Oh, for performance, because it's, yep. you know, I should have thought of that, right? Because if it mm -hmm. is fucked, there are things you can do to mitigate it to still be able to go, mm -hmm. you know, with that. But if it's a mess and you can't optimize what you have, yeah. then you're fucked. Yeah. You know, it's, you're really fucked because then are. all your other shit isn't going to work mm -hmm. as well. Ah, yeah. Interesting. So, and there's our, some company, Merrick's one, that they'll, they'll work with, I don't want to say idiots. I mean, they're going to work with people on whatever their goals are yeah. to help mitigate mm -hmm. because they, and there are other doctors out there. They're hard to find, yeah. but there are other doctors out there that will tell you what you're doing is not smart, Yeah. but then at least know you're going to do it anyhow. And if yeah. you're going to do it anyhow, how can we make this the, the least stupid we can actually The most make responsible it? way. Yeah. And they're... They're there. They're out there. At least when I was coming up, they weren't. It was yes. like everywhere I'd fucking go. It's like yeah. I go to the dentist and fucking tooth decay was because I was on testosterone. Dude, it was uh, that was hard back. <laughs> that was hard back then. But you know, nowadays it's we have so many HRT clinics and stuff. And I don't know the rulings and regulations that are trying to come down the pipeline to control it because they see there's money involved. Yeah. Anytime there's money involved, certain, you know. Sure. Things want to get involved because mm -hmm. they want a piece of it. Yeah. So, but as of right now, you know, Merrick and stuff, guys, it's going to help you out not only in the long run health wise, but also for performance, like we said. Yeah. And I don't, with the, what you're talking about, I think they postponed whatever that was to, mm -hmm. to kind of figure out basically how they can make money on it. Yeah. But outside of that, the, I mean, the, there's, there's like the conversations on PEDs, then there's like the reality. Because yeah. I've been on different panels and different forums where they'll ask me, and I'm no expert on this shit, but yeah. I know what the real, I know how this shit works in the real world. Yeah. Like just because, you know, a company like Merrick may not be able to prescribe unless they're in the state that you're in. Yeah. Most people are buying black market shit in the first place and they're getting, they're, they need, uh, you know, a company like Merrick just to look at the blood work and to help give them advice. Yes. Very few people, I doubt, are actually getting their shit through them. Yeah. Because they're not, A, they're not going to prescribe enough for what a competitive athlete would want. No. If anything, they can provide enough of a base for the TRT. Exactly. But that's such a small amount of what the person's actually taking in the real world. Yeah. So yeah. whatever yeah. whatever would get past that might fuck that up mm -hmm. is only fucking up this much. Yeah. Of Oh, so, so what? I won't be able to get one fucking CC a test. Yeah. What about the other fucking 10 that I'm buying from the bro in the gym? Yeah. I'm still taking that. But I need the, the labs. You know what I'm saying? I need a doctor that's yeah. going to be able to help mitigate this so my fucking kidneys don't explode or my heart doesn't blow up. I mean, it's, it's, it's important. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's important to talk about, mm -hmm. right? You're doing something that you know, it could be fine. No big deal. But do you want to risk it, you know? nowadays if you have the ability to legally talk to a doctor and say hey make sure you get me right take advantage of it mm -hmm. you know it's, it's not so taboo anymore to talk about hormone therapy and things of that nature and blood work and you know it's not taboo anymore which is like you said 10 15 20 years ago the hell is an hrt clinic you know you'd walk in somewhere and like man oh dude i've got tendonitis you know i've got tennis elbow i've got whatever do you use steroids? I'm like, yeah, what does that have to do with it? You need to get off those, and then we'll talk about rehab. Like, what? You know? Yeah. It, well, it's a different. I mean, you were kind of a part of that going back a decade ago. It was a whole different world, too, yeah. where, you know, it's, I, I, I sit back and I kind of laugh at myself when people will criticize, you know, I oh, mean, I can't believe they, these, let's say, you 10 years ago. I can't believe they weren't talking about this. I'm like, seriously, dude? Like, it's fucking, first off, it was illegal. Secondly, the DEA were fucking creating lists and going to people's houses, yeah, yeah. you know, and knocking on their door. Granted, it was illegal as fuck, mm -hmm. but still 5%, 10, actually maybe a large percentage of the people 
would be like, oh, fuck. And then they would just give up whoever they're getting it from because yeah. they yeah. think, <laughs> you know, they don't understand what's happening. Uh, the yeah. knock, whatever they called it. It happened. I mean, it, yeah. most of my friends at some point or another had that knock on their door. Yeah, or the little slip in the mailbox. Yeah, I just yeah. had to say, yeah. you know what, fuck you, go away. Yeah. But they didn't know they could say that. Yeah. So they're like, oh, yeah, I get it from John at the gym. And then, so you, you're like, fuck it. I don't want to be on any, I don't want not, you know, yeah. there was a reason why. Yes. And these st stupid Fox, I can't believe they were like, what the fuck? You're an idiot. Yeah. It, it was like, different. It was a different world. It's completely different. Yeah. It'd be like a crack dealer now getting on a podcast saying, guess yeah. what? I sell crack <laughs> yeah, and I do yeah. it on this corner. Yeah. It's like, come on, you dumb fucker. It, yeah. it doesn't make sense. Where now it's, it's. It's good and bad, right? Because now people can freely talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so it's out there, which is a good thing. Yeah. There's some bad components to it, but I think there's more good than there is bad at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is, it, it's, it's interesting how it evolves though, right? Because, yeah. because now, now everybody's only on TRT dose, you know? So now everybody, it's, it's only <laughs> 200 milligrams. Yeah, yeah. It's like 150 yeah. to 200 milligrams. That's what everybody yeah. fucking takes everybody. But that, yeah. that's the, yeah, that's the new natty, you know, it's the new, um, what do they call it when you lie, but you lie by omission. Yeah. Like, well, I, I do yeah. just take 150 or 200 this times 10 well just yeah. of that yeah i'm not telling you about this mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? yeah i only take like 200 milligrams of like mastron but that's it you know i'm not telling you about the three grams of test yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> only take the master I'll, I'll tell you about the intramuscular <laughs> i won't tell you about the subcutaneous exactly <laughs> You know, <laughs> I can see that being fucking true, though. <laughs> uh, dude, it is, man. It is. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you can only do everyone's taking the same stuff, whether it's good, you know, hopefully it's all legit. But if that's legit, there's only so many ways you can eat a carb. There's only so many ways you can do a bench press. At the end of the day, it comes down to hard work. And we hate to admit it, a little bit of genetics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's no reason in lying about certain things nowadays. Guys, just, you know, keep it real, educate yourself, and you're only going to get better. The um, We spoke a little bit about the genetics earlier to where, you know, I like to put the statement out there. You don't know how good your genetics are until you actually really try. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the other thing with hard work, it's kind of like – the all in that we talked about before, yeah. you know, you don't know what hard work is until you've actually done hard work. And then That's your right. definition of hard work is only your definition of hard work, not somebody else's. Mm -hmm. So I think the only way people can really learn what hard work is, is to do too much work. Yeah. And then they can find what yeah. that is. And actually then they find that their work capacity probably needs to increase. Yeah. You know, to be like, able to, oh, I, I could do, what was Tom Platt's thing where it's like, once you get to failure, you got five more reps. Yeah. You know, but it was a way of pushing past to see maybe, maybe that was your failure point or, oh man, I do have five more reps, you know? Yeah. I saw a video the other day of him speaking because he's got these stupid shorts that pop up every now and again. And it was, it, it made me laugh. Like some of his videos are motivational, but mm -hmm. some of them just fucking make me laugh. And it was about how he was saying that, and you might remember this because it's going, you my dates get missed up, but it's mm -hmm. probably true for you. Actually, I know it's going to be true for you because you trained in gyms earlier that had shitty bars. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah. he was talking about we how they would leave just a little space Did between the plates, plates so it would rattle, right? I'm like, dude, uh, that's not why it ha They did it because the bar whipped, dude, because yeah. if you, they were too tight. The or the clips got a little loose and it was, the, you know. Yeah. The, dude. <laughs> When I heard the plates rattling, I was like, this is about the tip. Mm -hmm. You know, this mm -hmm. side's about the flip. That wasn't good. Like, that didn't yeah. motivate me. That scared me a little bit. Yeah. So I'd rack it. Well, originally it was being done because the bars would whip. They'd whip with so 405. much. So you yeah, would, yeah, yeah. you'd still have strong collars, but you leave just a little space because that movement mm -hmm. created less bar whip. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, the bars were whipping at fucking 405. Yeah, so yeah, think yeah. about that. You know, now over time, now that they don't do that. I, do you, ever had a, you ever had a bar bend? I had one bend on me. And I think it was like with 550 and I walked it out and I, it was just like literally a, you know, when you get those 300 or whatever pound plates that's at Dick's Sporting Goods or whatever, and it comes with a bar, mm -hmm. like that was the bar. Oh God. And I walked it out and I did like 550, I was like 19 years old or 20 or something. And I, as soon as it, I went up, 
and it didn't come up right the bar stayed down and then so i tried i couldn't rack it right so now i can't get in the rack and so what i did is i sort of like let it slide down my back i my brother was in he as my witness he was in the garage and at this point i have a bar in the middle of my back and i'm bent over like doing a good morning <laughs> and so he was like what do i do what do i do i was like just let me drop it let me drop it and that sort of ducked out from under it but yeah you have any other good stories like that gym stories that are <sighs> dude i have one okay <laughs> okay i'll put it this way 2013 before my final collegiate nationals i was hitting my last squat so, you know, if you guys, power fish, you know this, you're pretty much hit your opener. Um, just testing it. Hey, I'm just going to hit my opener this week, especially, you know, we were single ply. And I walk out and I squat down. And at that point, someone had convinced me to go into heels. I'd never worn lifters or heels at any point. I had long legs, my leverage. So my leverage was screwed, but I wanted to wear them because they told me it would make me squat upright. <laughs> right. So I had squatted 800 at Worlds, like, 10 months before and i was having trouble with 750 so i'm like okay i'm we'll open up with 750 i walk it out i've got like one or two buddies spotting because they're like oh it's nothing i come down shifts my hips shift everything shifts whop, over the head right and so no big deal i'm fine little bruise whatever i go and do something that night <laughs> I come back. I was at VMI at the time. I go back into barracks, right? And then we can't really go to a hospital or anything. We're in barracks. Mm -hmm. I go back to barracks and I go to the bathroom. Everything's fine. I turn around. It was like someone dropped a red paint can in the toilet. And I go, I turn around. At this point, hearts up to 150 beats. Oh my God, I'm dying. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm dying on my butt. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so I call a buddy and he goes, is it dark red or is it bright red? I'm like, it's bright red. It looks like someone just poured paint in the toilet. He's like, oh, you're fine. It's not cancer. I hung up the phone. I was like, dude, wait, <laughs> wait, what? I'm dying. <laughs> I, so I didn't go to the hospital. I didn't. I should have. I should have gone. Guys, if that happens to you, please go to the hospital. I didn't go to the hospital. It was when I jumped the bar from earlier that day, the 750, my belt pinched into my intestine. So I, I went for in my belt, you know, you guys use 13 millimeter, like mm -hmm. whatever belt, it pinched into my intestines. I took my lever belt off, didn't think about it. Well, I, I must have pinched an intestine and it bled. And so I didn't, I didn't go to the bathroom. I didn't take a crap for like three days. So I figured, well, if I don't poop, then I won't see yeah. it, <laughs> you yeah. know, but yeah, I ended up being okay. But that was probably the craziest uh, story with that. With, with training being one of your top priorities throughout your life, your, I believe your first degree was in uh, business economics, mm -hmm. right? What, going through school, what, were, you, were you trying to figure out how training could support you the rest of your life and the business could help with that? Or was the training in school completely separate? For when I went through college, I didn't really give a fuck about school. It was just, it was all about training. Then I would figure it out later. Mm -hmm. This is just the shit that I was doing. I had no intent to be able to do anything yeah. with what I was taking there. Um, but then after a while, it's like, no, wait a minute. I think I can use mm -hmm. this to be able to help that. That's a great question. I, I think that at the time when I was 21, 22, I didn't give a shit. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be on Team Quest and go to IPF Worlds and break world records and that's all I cared about. And uh, oh, I got my business degree, I'll, I'll, do, I'll go to corporate and at night I'll be a monster in the gym. Well, I worked like, it didn't end up happening that way because you weren't, people think you go to college and you automatically guarantee a six figure job. Dude, reality check doesn't work that way, unfortunately. And uh, I worked a lot of jobs where I was earning low wages out of college and I was like, well, shoot, I'd probably earn more doing personal training or whatever than I am my degree, and I'd enjoy it. So I took a break from those business jobs, sales and, you know, who, whatever. And they were salaried and whatnot. Then I started personal training for a year. Enjoyed it, made good money. But I was like, okay, let me try again. I'll go into uh, computer information science now. So I went back to school and got a bachelor's in computer science with a concentration in cybersecurity. And uh, 
after that, I did that for a couple of years, traveled, did a ton of work for a few different companies. Then I was like, wow, oh, man, this is, this is getting tough. So then I finally worked for a hospital for about three years doing IT for them, working alongside engineers and network engineers and stuff. It was great. Loved it. Don't regret any of it. But it got to the point where I started getting looked over. Um, people in, in corporate situations, if you don't work for yourself, there's a chance at some point you may get a boss or you may, something may happen where you get screwed over. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like that. I come from a, a situation where I'm controlling my destiny with my hard work. And now someone else is ignoring me or whatever. And he's giving this guy who quit and came back all this money. And then I, I'm stuck. I stuck out through COVID and all this stuff. And I didn't even get a, you know, a $1 raise. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, cool. I'm just going to go do my own thing. The best advice I ever got was Justin Harris told me, if you took a 10th of the dedication you have towards lifting and put it towards your business and being successful financially, you're going to be a millionaire. Now I'm not a millionaire guys. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that, but I am making more money than I did doing all the corporate stuff. And I love every minute of it. And so what it was, was I had to realize, Hey, I'm getting older. I'm about to have a family. I need to make this work. How do I do this? Take my dedication, take my hard work and whatever I'm doing with lifting. And let's move it over here too. It's not going to take away from lifting, but let's move it to both of these work for yourself. And of course, when you work for yourself, you work more hours than you did not working for yourself, but you love every second of it. So I think it was the best advice I was ever given was you love this. The amount of dedication and passion you have towards lifting and training is no one can break you from that. You're going to do that for the rest of your life. You've been dedicated since you were 15. Let's put that towards something else too, right? And let's, let's make you successful so that you can still enjoy things and have a family and do those things and still be able to enjoy that. Because if not, I'm be homeless on the street and just back in the day, I used to bench 500. That ain't going to do it. Yeah. Oh, I think it's, I agree with what he said, but there's, that almost can become like one of those stupid motivational Instagram, you know, reels <laughs> yeah. where it, it's not really being transparent, where if, if you take all the, the discipline, the motivation, the effort that you put into the bodybuilding and that you put into the powerlifting beforehand, the key word there is all, all of it, yes. right? So now we're talking about the obsession from the time that you wake up in the morning to the time that you go to bed. Yes. We're talking about all the things that you need to do during the day that you really don't want to do, but you still have to do. Yeah. You still have to eat the fucking meals. You gotta. You still have to do all those things. And then when you apply that into your own business, all of that, right, then that means that there's going to be a whole lot of work that you have to do you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. That means there's going to be a whole lot of time you're going to put into it that you don't really know if it even yields a result or not. Yep. It means that all of it, where the, the motivational shit they like to kind of put out there mm -hmm. is – Okay, we're just talking about the fun stuff. Yeah. Like, dude, the fun stuff, like in bodybuilding, if you look at, because it's, I guess it's a really good fucking example, because the only time you're really not doing it is when you're asleep. Yeah. Right? So yep. what's that fucking eight hours a day? Maybe if you're lucky, you're sleeping. And eight then hours. you're still thinking about it. Yeah. You might wake up after four hours just to fucking get a meal in. Right? So let's, so fuck, let's say 18 hours a day you know, are being devoted to bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. The only part that you really fucking love and that when you think back on it, when you're 80 years old, are going to be some of the training sessions and maybe some of the time on stage. Yep. So five fucking percent of all the time is what you, all the other 95% is the shit that you just have to do. Mm -hmm. You're not like, yep. you're not like, man, I love rice. Or, man, I love traveling <laughs> yeah, to the dude, gym. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, that's not that. And oh, man. you see what I'm saying? So when you apply that to business, yep. that kind of means, okay, cool. There's going to be 5% of the time you're going to be like, fuck, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. But then 95% of the time, which just sucks, but you have to do it mm -hmm. because that 5% is so fucking awesome. And at the end of the day, it's and, worth and it. Dave, you know this too. Yeah. You look back and the times where you thought it's so much work. It's, I'm putting so much into this and there's so many things happen, relationships, bills, taxes, car crashes, whatever. All of it comes together. Dude, you only remember the good stuff, no matter mm -hmm. how hard you work. So it motivates you to be like, 
let me keep working hard because I know at the end of the day, I'm only going to remember the good stuff. Well, anyway. here's the cool thing. If you do remember any of the really, really bad stuff, you're only remembering that because you came back from it. That's right. You know what I'm saying? That's so that, that, yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. that adversity mm -hmm. part that plays into mm -hmm. all this. Um, so how long have you been solo entrepreneur to where that's all you're doing? Uh, oh my gosh, was it 2023 20, now? Um, about a year and a half, almost two years. So 2021, summer of 2021, after USA's, I did really bad. I decided this is something I really have to work hard for. So either I dedicate everything to it or I just do it for fun, focus on my corporate career and that, this, that, and the third. And that's why I'm here today. I still love doing it. Yeah. So it was like, hey, let's go full steam. Made my own LLC, got my insurance, started writing programs, doing, taking all the information I've learned from so many guys like Goggins and you know Sparkman and Cormier and, and all those guys. And I put it together and, and anything that I, I love it because I get more out of it giving back to people than I have accomplishing my stuff. I look back on my stuff. I'm like, oh, that's cool. But when I see a guy hit a 10-pound PR on deadlift he's been working for for two or three months, I feel so much joy from that. And see someone lose 50 pounds or, or be able to spend more time and pick up their kid or pick their kid overhead say they had a shoulder issue, man, that's so rewarding to me. And it, it sounds dorky, but it, it is more rewarding than – just being at a job I hate and making six figures. Um, at the end of the day, I'm lucky to have a significant other that supports me in my passion and we're able to, to live you know, comfortably with it and I support her in her passion. But without that support from her, I'd probably just be doing, chalk it up as a loss and just do my corporate job and give up everything else. But the fact when I have someone believes in me and I enjoy it, I have passion, like it's, it's meant a lot. Now I'm assuming most all your clients are online. Not all of them. I okay. still, I, I have a lot in the area of Virginia Beach. Yes. Um, but I've got some in Florida and Texas and, and all over. And uh, the cool thing is a lot of my clients, so I, I work with um, Iron Asylum Gym. And so I'll go in and, and train them in Virginia Beach whenever they want to get a session in. Hey, I need you to show me how to arch with a bench press. I, I want you to show me how to get, does my deadlift form look right? You know, there are certain things they want to work on. How do I do the belt squat? doesn't feel right you know how do I pull the slack out of the bar I can't explain that with a video or whatever so I'm lucky enough to work with them in person through that gym to be able to adjust things or, or whatnot but yeah the online clients I will do videos and stuff for them but it is it is good because it affords me to like it lets me be at home mm -hmm. more often and it allows me to continue my bodybuilding because I can go downstairs make a meal go back up work on my computer go downstairs, make a meal, go train, come back, do the chores, whatever. Well, what's yeah. cool is it you can work with the powerlifting base, you can work with the bodybuilding base, yeah. the gen, fitness, everybody can work mm -hmm. with general fitness base. But then the, the bigger base are, I don't want to say those that don't want to commit, the ones that want both, mm -hmm. right? They don't really want to compete. Like the power building type. Yeah, I mean... And that's a fucked up thing, right? Because to try to train both at the same time is damn near impossible, mm -hmm. right? So there, it has to be phasic, you know, throughout mm -hmm. a period of a year. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of not committing to one or the other. But that's mm -hmm. where most people really fall. Yeah. And you have a strong background in both, mm -hmm. you know. Thankfully, which, yeah, yeah. Which, which helps because, as we were talking about earlier, one of the – it's easier for people – just to throw weights around. And there's a point to do that. You know, I, I don't want to com completely criticize just lifting fucking heavy weights for reps. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a place for that, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, but there's also a place to where it has to be tightened up. Yeah. And you have to have, I think as a coach, you have to have the eye to be able to see when that should be done, especially if you're starting to work with, you know, older clientele, which yes. typically are the ones that can afford to pay somebody mm -hmm. who's mm -hmm. good to mm -hmm. help them. Because, they don't need to be going stupid fucking heavy on movements like we were talking about yeah. earlier, but not everybody knows how to see mm -hmm. that that's fucked up. And, and, and Dave, you've talked about this before on podcasts and, and I've heard you talk about it, but yes, 
book knowledge, all that stuff is important. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm not saying that in order to coach football, you got to be a lineman, you know, but or had to have gone to the Super Bowl, but it doesn't hurt, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of the there's certain things with certain forms. You may know a cue. They don't teach that in a book that may click with that person. Fix their deadlift. You can tell someone all day back straight. Here's a here's a broom. Make sure it stays straight and squat. Pull the slack out of the bar. And what? How do I do that? You're telling me I don't know. Okay, well, grab this bar. You should feel it on this part of your lower back and this glute. If your quads are firing, see how it's stiff and pull that. Okay, that's loose. Now we got to work. So it is important to have hands-on experience, in my belief, to really get clients to, or anyone to really get to the point that they fully understand it. Because I tell my clients and everyone, my goal isn't to ha- is not to have you for your whole life. My goal is to teach you everything I know so that you can walk into the gym and do it on your own. And do it safe and do it constructive and make progress and possibly even help others. I had a guy come in. He walked in. He was a little nervous. This is my boy, Jacob. But I'll give him a shout out. He didn't know what a dumbbell was. Couldn't tell you. And then you, uh, literally a year later, the guy's squatting like 315 and stuff. And uh, he was, he's not working with me right now because he's, he's busy with some other business stuff he's doing. But that was my goal, to teach him that, to do it safely to excel, to be able to show others and spread the word and be good with fitness and, and increase his knowledge. And then you, you move on. I, I think it's insanely important, right? Because it's, you can, not, maybe not at the highest levels, but if, if you're just the professor that's never trained, try to explain to somebody how to, how to brace their core under a heavy weight. Yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. You know, you or mean? try to explain what a lap pump is to a mm-hmm. novice lifter that's never had one. Mm-hmm. They know what their legs feeling tight feels like because mm-hmm. they've run at some point mm-hmm. in their kid, and they're like, man, my legs are tight. Yeah. You know, and they know what, you know, maybe what a bicep pump feels like. Yeah. You know, but lats, you know. How do I activate my hamstrings? How do I do that? I've never gotten a pump in my hamstring. Like, how do you isolate? So it's yeah. those type of things. And when I used to work, is a personal trainer. I had trainers underneath me and just mm-hmm. trying to get, and these are people that are in the fitness realm, you know, mm-hmm. aerobic instructors, wh- whatever, just fitness instructors just out of school, yeah. trying to get them to understand just some of this basic shit. Yeah. You know, they don't know because they haven't put the time in to have the mind muscle connection with certain moves. Some body parts just fucking take longer. Yes. Lats, you know, things mm-hmm. like hamstrings. Like the lower lats and hamstrings. Yeah, yep. yeah quads, yeah, okay, mm-hmm. easy. Biceps, fucking easy. Other ones, you know, it take, you can't just teach that in a book. No. What would it say? You know, the muscles full of blood. It feels yeah. like a hard-on. Like, what, what is it, <laughs> it going to say, you know? Yeah. Um, very, very fucking interesting. Where do you... <clears throat> So what's the rest of the year look like? Because we talked about the show, but where are you trying to, what, what are you into right now as far as so, learning? As far as learning Just goes? Just learning and, because you're a geek too. A little bit. I love reading abstracts and, and uh, you know, different uh, studies and things. But I would say right now, definitely in the off season, you know, focusing more on clients competing, trying to develop more of an understanding with how certain compounds and things work with each other that's what i'm on right now um and then as well as i plan on going back to school to get my master's in nutrition science uh so you know there's a few things on my mind with food and whatnot trying to see how that works but right now just learning a little bit more about compounds why why go back for that nutrition science i want to be I found another passion in food, you know, and helping people. It's the most important thing we do with our body. You know, yeah, movement and stuff, but what we put in, we can still be healthy without necessarily doing heavy lifting, but eating and and treating our bodies correctly. So I want to learn as much as I can with it and possibly go down, you know, a dietitian route. So dietitian or RD? Probably a dietitian. Yeah. To where I can market that to a larger audience and they can feel comfortable knowing oh this isn't just a gym rat which i get i understand because 
and you know this, Dave, mm -hmm. you do one show, you do one competition, all of a sudden you're a coach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone, there's 800,000 million bajillion coaches out there nowadays. Sometimes you have to do something that'll separate yourself. And whether that's increase your knowledge or get a, you know, a certain initial by your name, sometimes you just have to do it. Mm -hmm. If it's for the right reason, definitely do it. You know, don't just do it just to, oh, I just want to make more money. Like, no. You know? Yeah. But yeah, that that's where I'm at right now. And just continue, you know, always the reason we, we still do this, especially as we get older and I'm not that old, but you know, I've been at it for a little bit. I still come in with the same passion and you heard us yelling and screaming from your office earlier. Um, I just love learning new ways to train, new ways, exercises, feel equipment feels and things like that. So I haven't done everything. I haven't focused on kettlebell training for just a month solely. You know, I, I, I know how to train with kettlebells, but I haven't done that. So there's so many things I still haven't done that. I always just want to learn and I want to know it all. I want to, I want to learn it. So do yeah. those things interest you? Like just doing kettlebell shit for a month? Anything, anything okay. interests me. Can it help improve something? If it can, well, maybe it might not improve my power through your bodybuilding, but will it help improve my mobility and overhead strength or shoulder, you know, stability or something? That interests me. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be just how do I get my bicep bigger? It's anything. There's so many. I mean, just, you, you know, your gym here, if people have never been here, it's absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. So many different bars. You know, the guys I was with training earlier, they walked in, they're like, I don't know what any of this is. <laughs> and me coming from a background, like, all right, you know, this is a football bar. This is a, <laughs> this is a Mike McDonald, Cambridge mm -hmm. bench bar, things like that. Um, you know, but there's so much to learn. I just, I love it, you know. You said that you, um, you were in, your, your fiance, you're engaged. So mm -hmm. is, there, is there a date? Man, we, so <laughs> we had the first attachment photo shoot Monday. We were at the beach Sunday morning. I had a plane flight at 11. I brought her family there and my family there. And uh, you know, I'm like, oh, look at that boat. We're like looking at the water. Look at that boat, look at that boat. Oh yeah. And then I turn around, look who's here. And her family's here. I, you know, I throw her the ring. We're all crying and all that stuff. And two hours later, I'm on a flight. So it just happened. We haven't put any right. dates or anything. Well, my question: Are you going to be? Are you going to be big or lean? <laughs> dude, yeah, the I, seats, I, man. <laughs> dude, I should. <laughs> hey, no joke. I've actually thought about the photos and stuff because <laughs> you know the photos are forever. No, I know that. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, I can't do it in my off season. Like, <laughs> my double chin will be showing. So let me do it. Like right before, you know, like right after a show, like maybe two weeks, three weeks after. Um, that way I'll be able to have, you know, do what it, maybe, maybe like a month after I'll just stay there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, that way my, my jawline will be in and I'll look decent. Otherwise, and you know, looking back on the photos from the multiply days and stuff <laughs> and you look at your face and you're like, I didn't know it could get yeah. that round. I didn't right. know it could get that. Big. My mindset was I'm going to be the fucking most bloated I can possibly <laughs> oh, be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that way it's, it's memorialized. It's, it's never going to go away. <laughs> it's bad. And the wife has to have it up in the house. <laughs> like, yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> were there, were there any, any topics I didn't bring up that you sent over to us? Cause I think I got through, actually, there was one thing I wanted to bring up because it's, I don't know how to tie this into the podcast, but it's let's a, just talk about it. I yeah. know, but there's a subject that you, you'll understand where I'm coming from in a minute. People want me to speak more about restoration methods okay. where that becomes a little fucked up because if your diet's on point, your training's on point, mm -hmm. then the restoration methods really kind of become not necessary, mm -hmm. right? Like what exactly are you going to need all these extra things, uh, contrast showers, you know, cold yeah. baths, all, what do you really need those for if you're recovering? That, that's where I have this like all the new time. stuff that's coming in. Yes. So Do you I, use any of it? I went to uh, the cryo yeah, booth yeah. one when I was right before I set the world record. They were new in the area. I tried it. I'm open-minded. Didn't do shit for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm old school. You know, they've changed rice up a little bit, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they, now we know that more heat is better than just cold all the time. And sometimes the contrast is the best because you push the blood flow, blood flow, carry nutrients, blood flow is what heals. Hence, that's why you get, you know, the PRP and stuff, injections, because we're putting blood flow in places that don't get a lot of blood flow and it helps healing. That being said, dude, if it's, if it ain't rusty, it ain't trusty. And if it ain't broken, don't try to fix it. So my whole thing when I was powerlifting was 
ice baths at probably like at least two or three times a week. Um, get swelling down. Even if I didn't really have it, just get some of the swelling down. Certain places push blood flow with, with uh, heating pads, things like that. Maintaining mobility. I would do a chiropractor every other week, a session every other week. It's between 50 and 60 bucks. It's not insane. And then I would do a deep tissue every other week. And I would go into the deep tissue with a purpose. Everything you got to do with a purpose. So I would go in and I would say, hey, pec minor is feeling tight. Let's loosen up my chest. I, f I have had a tweak. I benched it this week, you know, or my shoulder mobility is off. Let's, let's strip these shoulders, get them loose. So my whole thing was old school stuff. It works. I've tried some of the newer stuff. Guys, remember, if you ever get hurt or anything like that, definitely ice, take down the inflammation. They can't even do surgery on certain tears until the inflammation is down. So get the inflammation down right away and then start pushing the heating, the mobility work. You know, if you have a hot and cold bath, that's totally fine. Do that. Flush that blood flow, um, increase the blood flow. But yeah, me was like more the basic stuff that works that always worked the best for me. Are you using any of it now? I, I, I spot ice now. I don't do, I don't really have any issues with my hips or IT bands. Knees will act up every now and then. Um, if quads become too tight, they pull on certain ligaments and stuff. So I'll ice, spot ice. I don't like ever do ibuprofen or anything because I make sure if it gets to that point, I need to refigure some things out. And sure, I'll, if I have to take an leave or something every blue moon because I, you know, something got a little tweaked or something, sure. But I like to focus on if I hurt this, I learned from it. So now I need to do mobility work. If, whatever. If, if money wasn't an issue, right, and, and mm -hmm. access wasn't an issue, because those are two big issues when you start dealing with things like cryotherapy, yeah. you know, IV therapy, and all this mm -hmm. other kind of stuff. So the, the, the SARMs and the BPC one. Well, I'm just stuff. like um, like different IV cocktails, like a Myers mm -hmm. cocktail, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you got to find some place to do it, or yeah. you know, if you're Joe Rogan, they just come to your house, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, vitamin therapies. What what things would you look into doing? If money was on issue, if money's not an issue or, or, you know, convenience is in yeah, other I, words, uh, the hot, cold contrast. Let's say you have a ice tub and a hot tub right next to each other. Yeah. Then yeah, it's right there. Yeah. Do that. You know, yeah. Um, for me and most powerlifters, we get tight. And I notice, especially when you put on more muscular muscularity, more size, I don't have, even though I was stronger with powerlifting, when I got bigger, I lost a lot of mobility. So I would definitely say that stretching on your own is 100% you got to do all the time. And then also deep tissue massage work is my go-to. Strip the muscle, lengthen it. You'll, if you guys, if you are tight under your arms or somewhere, um, pending you don't have an actual injury, you go get a deep tissue massage, loosen up that muscle, and you're going to notice a way more range of motion, things like that. I would say that I don't necessarily need the, the cocktails and all that stuff. I sort of, this is going to sound like I'm, you know, being a dick or whatever, but I sort of think that's, it, you, that means that you're trying to find a shortcut, not doing the other things to get the nutrients and recovery that you need. That's, you know? in a way, that's kind of how I realm it because it's a lot of the things I don't think are necessary if you have all the other things on point. Exactly. Um, bodybuilding and i don't know as well because i didn't do it very much mm -hmm. you know it but i know with powerlifting you start peaking for a meet you start getting at the short end of the stick mm -hmm. you know four weeks out five weeks out so yeah. you kind of need to start doing something yeah. because you're you're just beat to fuck yeah um bodybuilding i don't think that's necessarily the case the closer you get to a show mm -hmm. because the training while hard it's more the diet yeah i would say the bodybuilding would be more it's the off season when you're mm -hmm. trying to push it really hard, but then the food, you know, all the excess food should be kind of taken care of, yeah. you know, the, unless you're just training like an idiot. Yeah. And, but then again, that goes back to if you're training like an idiot or you're doing something wrong, then we have to, yeah, we don't need to put a bandaid on an open wound or try to treat the symptom. We need to find what's actually yes. causing it, whether it's training or whatever we need to find what's actually causing the issue and then work back from there and, and it should be okay this yeah. could also happen on the other end of the coin because when we look at this this kind of dawned on me when you said that when we look at this we're assuming that they're training too hard 
You know, they could also yeah. not be training yeah. hard enough. That's a fact. And then they're not making progress. And then mm -hmm. they're looking at all these other things to try to, because they think they're not recovering, mm -hmm. where the fact is they're just not doing enough to stimulate. Well, I'm not getting as big as so-and-so. So either he's doing too many drugs, or maybe if I try this and that, it's like, mm, most yeah. of the time, it's just the amount of effort you're putting into it. Yes. So that for those people... Just train harder. I don't know what real advice to give Tell them. Is, Tell them, Dave. Or, or, you know, like just get around other people that do. Yeah. Right? Because there's your, again, that's a weird one because you, you only know how to train as hard as what you've ever trained. Right? And then people bitch, you know, and say that I'm an idiot because the people are going to overtrain. And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, overtrain, then you know it's too much. You know, it kind of falls yeah. into that. I mean, what's the, what's the saying? I'm going to mess this up, guys, but I'm a meathead. But if, like, you hang out with five uh, successful business people, you're going to be the six, right? If you hang out with five people who push themselves hard, you're going to be the six. If you train with five or if you train with five people that just go to the gym and talk on the phone, you're going to be the six mm -hmm. that talks on their phone. Yeah. Any other topics that you want to bring up or, or you thought I was going to ask that I didn't ask? No. I, I, would, I would ask you this, though. I came up in 2014 with Steve Goggins, I actually handled him mm -hmm. at his last meet he ever did at Raw Unity down in Florida. I want to know, we came up here and did some deadlifts way back. I want to know what's the craziest thing you've ever seen in your gym. Um, did you come up when he pulled the 800? Yeah. That's up there. That's up there. Really? Cause he was, yeah, because he was fucking like old. You know, he's older now. He's his, he was in his, he was like 51 or 52. Yeah, I mean, that was like, I forget what it was, but I'd have to ask him. But yeah. it was like three decades of pulling over 800 pounds. Yeah. You know, that was, that ranks up there because it, it didn't really sink in until later. You're like, mm -hmm. man, this fucker's been pulling this for like 40 years. Yeah. Conventional. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was something that yep. was like, what the fuck just happened? You know, that yep. that was one um, there was another one where, I mean, there's a lot of funny ass ones, but yeah, yeah, yeah. there was one when, you know, Brian Carroll came up for one of the first times and the whole joke around, cause he said, I'm, you know, I'm only going to work up to like a grand, you know, and it was <laughs> yeah, just like yeah, only yeah. a grand, it was like yeah. only a grand, only like, grand. you know, it was, and, and it was just, I mean, it was easy. There was once that, um, Vogelpohl came out for one of those things and mm -hmm. he had a, he had a boot on cause his, he fucked his ankle up. So he broke okay. his ankle. So he had this walking boot on for fucking a couple months or whatever it was he comes out takes the boot off and fucking squats like 10 50 1100 puts the boot back on you know it was oh one of the God. it was stupid <laughs> shit like that <laughs> you know but they're the, those are the ones that come to mind right that away room, yeah, yeah. because there's you know some kind of story behind it yeah. with that that gym there though um i liked way better than this one. Oh, uh, really yeah. what was it the atmosphere what was it it like was the just that was it was a lumber yard yeah that yeah, was just enclosed you know, and it was just a dump. You know, the <laughs> cement was cracked. Yeah. You know, there was bat shit behind the leg press because the bats, you know, there mm -hmm. was bats in there at night. Yeah. And that took care of all the mosquitoes. Now I got fucking mosquitoes in the summer. It's like, I need bats, you know, but, yeah. you know, and um, the fucking, I would be training at night and a possum would run across. It's shit like that, you know. It's like, this is, <laughs> yeah. I loved it, you know, the way yeah, it yeah. was. And then when we came over here, it was, this is, new you know it's it just yeah. a different vibe a different feel it's fine i'm used to it now but i've always trained in those places that were kind of like that would you say th would you say this is better business wise though like for the oh, yeah, FTS yeah, end of the yeah probably yeah yeah it's better for my staff i mean because yeah. before you know they, they were all shoved in one office so it was better for the staff definitely better for the videos but you know yeah. better for all that because we had to walk across the way mm -hmm. and all the other kind of stuff and it's um and it's it's more affordable because mm -hmm. they kept increasing the rent yeah, to where yeah. we got to a point where we, we can buy that we can build this and buy it for less than what that fuckhead wanted to charge us for rent which i say fuckhead but it was a favor you know because now it's you know equity that we're able yeah. to build into a you know a building where yeah. before we didn't have that um and it was a different transitional time too you know so it's Better for the business, a hundred percent. But the other part is, it's, I still miss that other fucking place. I know, man. I mean, <laughs> I, I remember going there, and like I said, I remember watching when I was coming up through USAPL. I still watched WPO. Yeah, I still watched Benny pull that, you know, nine ninety or thousand, whatever it was, thousand three. Um, Steve squat a thousand. The Mountaineer Cups. Mm -hmm. 
all that stuff. Um, Gene Bell, all, all that stuff, man. Pacifico. I could just keep naming them. Um, Jim Williams, all of them. I just loved it. And when I would go to a place like what you had, I was like, this is what it's about. Let me go bang my head on the bar and, you know, do a squat and have it squirt out. Like, it mm -hmm. just gave mm -hmm. you that vibe, you mm -hmm. know? So. How did this walking into this place feel compared to that one? Uh, to you? I will say this location that you've developed, it feels still hardcore, but it's more professional in a good way yeah in a good way and the fact that you have to be professional to be successful mm -hmm. on the business side and whatnot so i get that but i'm not gonna lie it feels like you have way more stuff in here now like i don't know it just it feels like that maybe because it's like the setup or stuff that's a good question i'd have to actually think about it yeah because it's we're constantly rotating you know things mm -hmm. in and out yeah I, when we first every place i've ever been was wide open when we went in yeah like really organized like the middle was open yeah and then i get this fucking thing and even like i can i can fit it you know like if we come up if there's something else that we have I remember you had that table in the middle at the old yeah. yeah this used to be in the middle there just until about four months ago then we moved it over here because we had to set up the podcast mm -hmm. every time oh, right and then tear it down because people still you know kind of train in here yeah where now we can leave it all set up and i didn't want to fucking do it i really didn't i fought that i'm like it's I, you know it's the right thing it makes total fucking sense like there's no reason why owen should have to take two hours to set up the fucking <laughs> podcast sorry it, owen yeah it, it makes total sense but i'm like fuck it's always been there it's always been and there. that's the problem you know with especially when you've been in business for 25 years is anytime you catch yourself say it's always been you got to stop and bite your tongue and say you can't say that because mm -hmm. that's how you put yourself out mm -hmm. you know business entirely yeah um, any other parting thoughts no the last one that i did want to ask yeah. you did you and i want you to be honest yeah did you lose any passion when the sport went away from gear lifting and what we've known forever from the blasts, you know, shirts and all that stuff to the raw where it's pretty much just raw. Now, did you lose any of the passion where it's like, you don't see the smacks on the backs and the, you know, the big lifts at a local meet, you know, you see more of a four or 500 pound squat at a local meet, maybe a 600 pound. But back in the day, you go to any meat you know that was geared and you're seeing nine hundred thousand pound squats and stuff did you lose any passion from that for the sport or was it a different there, there was there was a dip right and but but it also coincided with me exiting the sport mm. right so if i exited the sport in 2005 you know then the raw stuff really starting it didn't really even be talked about until like 2010 mm -hmm. you know maybe yeah. 2012 is when it really started to pick yeah. up so during that, say, 2005 to 2010, I'd be lying if I said I loved powerlifting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I, I went through the phases of grief, you know, mm -hmm. to where, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I fucking hated it, you know, and, it's, and didn't want to be a part of going to meets and stuff like that. But yet it's kind of part of the identity and we're sponsoring lifters. So I had mm -hmm. to kind of just keep that shit. Mm -hmm. So the way I was able to mentally deal with that is get a hold of Justin, get a hold of people like that, train completely different, yeah. find some different objective that maybe will satisfy the taste mm -hmm. and the need. It didn't for me, but at least it was enough to create the distraction. Mm -hmm. And then in, when it started with like the first raw unities in the new England record breakers or whatever it yeah. was, yeah. that was weird right because at that time nobody this is some history that i think a lot of people just don't know yeah most people didn't like raw actually everybody didn't you like knew raw. when you showed up to a meet you looked at the guy who was raw and you're like oh he just he doesn't have training partner or he must train his, you don't have any money or whatever yeah even then i mean because the, the ipf side usapl side that was all single ply mm -hmm. then you had the multiply then obviously the companies that are involved they don't want to see the gear go away mm -mm. you know so all the the governing powerful interests in the sport were Raw didn't play into their interest at all. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the kickback. And then some of the multiply guys would go, some of the single ply guys would go. Then in 2012, 2013, it started to pick up a little bit more steam. Mm -hmm. And then either CrossFit, you know, other things started to feed into the Raw. Mm -hmm. Then it started to pick up steam. Mm -hmm. And that 
re-engaged me mm -hmm. in a way because it wasn't like the first iterations of raw were not everybody people that weren't strong to begin with that just mm -hmm. found a way to act like they were strong mm -hmm. right well i'm doing it without the suit yeah right and so a lot of the backlash that those original people were getting were and hell you might have even been in it around that 2012 2013 era that was 2014 yeah. was like if you fuckers are so strong why don't you put the gear on and show yep. us how and that was most of the narrative yeah right mm -hmm. and then at some point and i don't know the exact date that started to flip and I like, I like when things get really fucking weird and they turn on their head. Mm -hmm. Like at some point it started to flip and it started to crack me up because it's now I'm sitting there thinking, okay, this thing, whatever it is, is now growing at an exponential rate completely against all the best interests of the companies that are actually making a lot of money on it, mm -hmm. the gear companies. This doesn't work for them. Mm -hmm. But the, then that was like, these, to me, it's like the lifters are taking control. Yeah, that's, right? that's a good So yeah, the lifters are fucking taking control, and this is the shit. Because even though I sold gear, I was a retailer. I didn't make that much yeah. money selling metal shit. I, yeah. it, it fucking wasn't even a valid revenue source. I was breaking even, if yeah. anything. But I'm like, this is cool as fuck, because all the bitching that I've heard about powerlifting my entire life is now going to change. Yeah. Because the lifters are going to take control, yep. which was didn't work out that way, but it looked that way. Because mm -hmm. then some of the fuckers started lifting more weights than the people in gear. Yeah, then, yes, and yes. Like people, in my mind, this is cracking me the fuck up, mm -hmm. right? Because and at the same time, I'm like, thank God I'm done. Because how bad would it suck for me to get in a meet and then squat my third, full canvas and shit, and, and then have four people guy. right after me? Like that would just fucking be devastating to me and um so it's it, in a way yes but then when i started to see the potential of the lifters are going to take control mm -hmm. and maybe all the political bullshit will stop because mm -hmm. that's always been a huge part oh yeah Just of separating the federations right? and, and it, it didn't you yeah. know but it looked like it, you know, that, that re-engaged because then it was like, okay, cool. And then the, there's been, there's goods and bad of social media. The, the cool thing with the social media is when you get down to the, the, the grit of it and the UGSS things and the things that you came to, everybody in that sport or any strength sport, they all have the same passion that they share. Mm. They may bitch and say stuff online, but you put them all in the same gym you know training training hard lifting weights you know raw guys are cheering for the multiply the multi guys are cheering yeah. for the raw you yep. know they're all in the same place yeah. where they're doing what they love to do 100 um and that seems to be starting to happen more yeah so in a, what's typically just a fractured sport yeah. so it's long answer but it's it's kind of iterations how it kind of goes through yeah, the whole thing where it's the biggest takeaway i have that i'll put out to other lifters is when you the move up into the levels of any of these sports you're it's a big bubble it's still a bubble we're all in a bubble the sport mm -hmm. in itself is a bubble mm -hmm. but the higher you move up in the sport the smaller that bubble becomes yeah. it doesn't become bigger it becomes smaller and then you forget why you got into it in the first place yeah. Right, because then as it's saying IFBB Pro is concerned with IFBB Pro issues, mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. They forget about the person that stepped on stage for the first time yeah. and what that was like and how it transformed your trajectory. Or the lifter forgets about the first time they competed. And um, sometimes it takes a little detachment from when they retire, you know, five, six years to, to realize yep. it wasn't about that. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of all about this stuff here. Mm -hmm. But while they're in that tiny little bubble, they also need to remember they're in a tiny little bubble <laughs> and they, uh, and they need to, they need to maximize that fucker because it can pop like that mm -hmm. at any time. And you don't want it to, to pop and not get what you want out of it. Mm -hmm. Cause you put for yourself, you put so much into it, yeah. right? You, you can't let that fucker pop for dumbass reasons. Yeah. You know? I agree. <laughs> I, that's a, hey, that's a good point. Any parting thoughts? No, nah, just super, uh, super thankful to come on here, man. Like I remember watching this uh, lead FTS videos and just squat videos and everything in general and West Side stuff and, you know, 531 and everything from when I first started. And 
never in a million years that I think I'd be sitting across from Dave Tate and doing the podcast. So no, that's awesome. It's great to have you that. out. And it's going to be very fun to watch where you go from here. Thank you. Yeah, um, hopefully. Yep. <laughs> your All your contact information is in the description, but where's the best way, the best place for people to get a hold of you or stay up with you? Uh, definitely right now, Instagram. I have a Facebook. I rarely check it. Yeah. Uh, it's more for family. Yeah. But uh, Instagram, I have my business email on my Instagram page, so you can just tap the email button and, and email me directly. I check that every day. Uh, but yeah, my Instagram, I'm, I'm doing a much better job at, at posting more often. When I was a powerlifter, I was like, I post my top set or like my meet, and I just wouldn't post anything, mm -hmm. right? Because all we were back then was we were respected for what we did on the platform. And then I quickly realized like, oh no, social media, you have to post more often and have more engagement and stuff like that. So I'm doing a better job now. So definitely my my social media, it's just my name, John C. Revis, uh, look that up. And uh, yeah, I'll be able to, to talk with you guys. All right, guys, thanks for listening. Subscribe to the channel, leave a review and join the crew. We're done.